Good morning, everyone. It is 9.04 and we'll be starting the meeting shortly. All the councillors are present today. No one is phoning in. Just let me turn off my volume so I don't hear myself. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order at 9.04 a.m. For the agenda, we have two items to add. We will add item 11.1, uh, 2019-2020 uh, Intermunicipal Mediation Verbal Report, FOIP S21, Disclosure Harmful to Intergovernmental Relations, and item 11.2, Advice from Official, FOIP, Section 24.1. Were there any other changes to the agenda? Seeing none, can I have someone move that we accept? Councillor Vandermeer, all in favor? Motion carries. Adoption of minutes. Any changes? or amendments to the minutes. Seeing none, can we have a motion to accept? Councillor Lougheed. Councillor Lougheed moves, all in favor? Motion carries. Item four, public hearing. Uh, public hearing bylaw 1076 slash 20 application number 08 slash 19 to amend the land use bylaw. So I'll call the public hearing to order at 9.06 a.m. Everyone present shall register. All persons wishing to speak shall be recognized by the chair. Every presenter shall identify themselves and the organization, if any. If a presenter becomes repetitive, they may be limited by the chair. No recording devices will be permitted other than the live stream. And breaks within the hearing will be called at the chairman's discretion. First, the development officer will explain the background of the application. Then the applicant will be invited to outline the reasons for the application. At any time, the council members have the opportunity to ask questions. Any submissions received from other agencies will then be read out. Then anyone who is present and whom is in favor of the application will be asked to submit his or her presentation. Following this, comments will be requested from anyone who is opposed to the application. The applicant will have the last word and thus respond to any issues raised previously. Uh, to start off, Jose Rees will outline the background to the application. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. This public hearing is for bylaw 1076-20, which intends to redesignate approximately 27.4 acres of land from the Manufactured Home Park District and Hamlet Residential District to the Institutional District. Council gave first reading to the bylaw on February 11, 2020, as required by legislation, notice of today's public hearing was advertised in the local newspapers and comments were invited from adjacent landowners and referral agencies. The applicant is Eric Hanson, Director of Public Works and Infrastructure on behalf of Clearwater County. The subject lands are located to the east of Highway 761 along Railway Avenue within the hamlet of Leslieville. The county's ultimate intention is to construct a public building to house the Leslieville public services facility on the subject lands. If, done, if the land use amendment is successful, the county will then submit a development permit application to the planning department for review and potential approval. Legal and physical access to the lands is by way of railway avenue adjacent to the north property boundary. The land is currently vacant but contains a pipeline held by Prairie Storm Energy Corporation. This pipeline doesn't contain sour gas. Surrounding land uses are institutional, hamlet, residential, and agriculture. The application has been evaluated against policies and regulations from the Municipal Development Plan and the Land Use Bylaw. No concerns have been identified. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Council, do you have any questions for the development officer? Teresa. Thank Council Lane. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I do, and I probably should know this. I'm just trying to remember uh, exactly where that pipeline is on the on the plans. I don't see it in today's agenda package. You're asking me about the map, the location of the, the... The location of this, the pipeline. It is, yeah, I don't think I included that map in the package, but it's, it goes to the middle of the property, basically. It comes from the north. Right in the middle? Okay. I guess Public Works is aware of it and where it lies, so everything should be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for the development officer? Are there any comments? Have any comments been received from referral agencies? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. The Municipal Planning Commission reviewed the application on March 19th, 2020, and the NPC recommends that Council favorably consider granting second and third readings to the subject land use by law amendment. Alberta Transportation expressed no objections in principle to the amendment, but pointed out that Highway 761 it's a future high load corridor. And as a result, they're planning for an ultimate 60 meter right of way width. AT also pointed out that the highway 761 and Township Road 394A intersection is currently a type one intersection without any upgrades. As development happens in the area, the highway intersection may eventually require upgrading. And finally, they pointed out that a roadside development permit will be needed for the new facility. No concerns or standard comments regarding the proposal were received from Fortis Alberta and the county's public works department. What is the current right of way? If the future one is going to be 60? I believe it's about 30 right now. 30, OK. So they do have some room to, to, to widen the road. Right. Thank you. I would like to invite the applicant to speak to the proposal and to add any comments in support of their request and to respond to the agency comments. No additional comments, Mr. Chair. I invite comments from any member of the public wishing to speak in favor of the application. Seeing none. Were there any written submissions in favor of the request? None was received, Mr. Chair. I invite comments from any member of the public wishing to speak in opposition to the application. Were there any written submissions opposing the request? None was received, Mr. Chair. I would like to invite the applicant to present any final remarks. No additional comments, Mr. Chair. I will close the hearing at 9 12 a.m. Thank you. We will move to item 5.1 consideration of second and third readings bylaw 1076 slash 20 application number 01 slash 20 to amend the land use bylaw. Staff is recommending second and third reading of the bylaw, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any further questions or comments or discussion from Council? Can I have a motion for second reading? Well, Councillor Lang. Further discussion on second reading. I will ask the question. All in favor? Motion carries. Is there a motion for third reading? Deputy Reeve Swanson. Further discussion on third reading of the bylaw. I will ask the question. All in favor? Motion carries.
Item 5.2, Sturgeon County Request Resources for 2020 Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference event. Introduce yourself uh, as you're not on the live stream so right. people know who's speaking. Jerry Pratt, Economic Development Officer for the County. Thank you. Um, I have a uh, request for a decision. This is based on um, I have a request for a decision based on an item that was brought to Council last meeting. Uh, this comes from Sturgeon County, who is um, planning an event at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference. Uh, they would like to have a large panel for basically a pro-Alberta and educational uh, session, trying to get others to come in. And uh, from the information that was presented last time, uh, council asked for more detail, and so I was able to get a little bit more detail um, from Deputy Mayor of Sturgeon County, Neil Cuomo. Uh, he said the total budget for this event is $100,000. Um, this is meant to cover a keynote speaker, which is Rex Murphy, four to six uh, key message speakers, door prizes, seating, and food for up to 600 guests. Um, they wanted to have an event with the level of speakers that would actually bring people from other provinces in. Uh, that was one of the questions I had is, this sounds like a great thing for Albertans to attend, but how are we going to actually get this message out to anybody else? And that's why they uh, decided on Rex Murphy would be a high enough level to uh, attract others. Um, from uh, those who have contributed so far, uh, this was as of March 14th, Greenview County, Municipality of Wood Buffalo, Lac La Biche County, Lac Saint County, Surgeon County, and Wetaskiwin County. Um, the, uh, Deputy Mayor Como actually said there were a few other organizations that would wanted to participate as well, uh, volunteer, but uh, that we're not willing to commit at that time financially. Um, the range of support they've received so far, and this is, was received after uh, the agenda was submitted, is that uh, most of the submissions so far have been um, between five to $10,000. Any questions from council? Any comments from council? Councillor Laird. Um. Yes, I looked at this, and, and given this uh, cancellation Could we of... turn down Councillor Laird's volume, because we're getting feedback on that. Not that we don't want right. to hear what she has to say. All right, uh, given the cancellation of FCM and the current uh, COVID situation, I guess for me, the recommendation I would be making is to consider uh, the support of funding this, but uh, through the 2021 um, budget cycle, so we can look at that with regard to uh, the rest of uh, our various other programs uh, so that we see it in context with all of our spending. So I, I think that that's the prudent way forward. Uh, we're not doing FCM 2020. So I, I think we've got time to think about this. And we certainly know the range now between five and ten thousand uh, uh, dollars. So I think we need to consider it as part of the budget. That would be my recommendation at this time. So FCM has been canceled? Or are we just assuming it's going to be canceled? Uh, for me, it's an assumption. Okay. It hasn't for sure, but I, uh, given the circumstances that are happening uh, globally, I can well imagine that they'll be uh, probably making that announcement in the coming days or weeks. Further discussion from any councillors? Councillor Vandermeer. 
I, I would just concur with Councillor Laird's uh, assessment. Uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that FCM will not be able to uh, hold their convention, and therefore we can address this uh, in the fall and, and for next year. Other comments, or can we have a motion to have this? Can you turn on your mic no, and repeat sorry. that for the um, last Sorry. Um, to, uh, I, I make a motion then to uh, look at supporting this initiative, and we take a look at this during the budget of 20, for budget 2021, and uh, considering for FCM uh, in 2021. If that makes sense. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Motion carries, and you'll update uh, Sturgeon County? I will. Thank you very much. Item 6.1 is a delegation at 1015, so we will be skipping ahead to item 7.1. Pages. Is uh, Mr. Martinson doing that? Should we move to a different item? Is okay. Mr. Evans? Good morning, Revolven Council. So the item before Council this morning is on Clearwater County post-secondary scholarship policy amendments. The recommendation is that Council approves the new Clearwater County post-secondary scholarship policy during the September 24th, 2019 regular council meeting, ag and community staff brought forward a revised post-secondary high school scholarship policy for council's approval. Council reviewed the new policy and asked for a further amendment that would allow a new homeschooled student to be eligible for post-secondary scholarships, as well as authorization of counselor attendance. In regard to that policy, the policy has been rewritten to reflect the changes expressed by council. Attached is, is the policy for council's review that reflect all past conversations. If council had any comments on the attached policy, administration would be welcome to address them. Any questions? I do have one, one comment uh, with the Scholarships going to the high school, it's very, it's well understood how that will be promoted within the high schools. Has there been any thought into how the homeschool scholarship will be advertised to residents of the county? Administration uh, felt we would reach out to the groups that do the homeschooling as well as post it on our website. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councillor Laird. With regard to the uh, new policy on point number two, and it might be more of a wording uh, thing, and it says uh, the quali qualifying high schools will include all high schools located in Clearwater County, and I'm wondering if it should say within Clearwater County boundaries uh, so that it's all encompassing because right now there we only have one high school in our municipality i don't know if if that is too specific or if we're i'm more curious out of just that little bit of wording to make sure that we do encompass um, the caroline and rocky schools okay can that change be made 
Any further questions about the post-secondary? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, I have a comment, and I just want councillors' um, thoughts on this. On uh, item three, it says the qualifying, qualifying homeschool student must be enrolled in an approved homeschool program and registered with a homeschool association or board acting in Clearwater County. I just want to make a note, I'm familiar with uh, the homeschooling programs and uh, I would hazard a guess that 90% of the homeschoolers within Clearwater County are registered with other programs in the province. There's many um, based out of Red Deer, Okotoks, all over, and they're mainly um, operated through, on, <coughs> excuse me, online. So I'm not sure how many are actually in the county. And there could be um, a homeschooling board in the county where students outside of Clearwater County are registered through. So all I'm saying is there's many students within the county that are registered with homeschooling programs elsewhere in Alberta. So I, I'm kind of thinking this should be opened up to, um, instead, of, uh, instead of reading um, a board acting in Clearwater County, that it should just be opened up to homeschooling students that live within the county. I, I, I know myself, I, I ended up having to homeschool one of my, my children and uh, I selected different boards uh, from other parts of Alberta because they offered the curriculum that I wished my daughter to uh, get. When I read item three, I made the assumption that acting in Clearwater County meant that they might not have an office here, but because they have students in the county, they are acting within the county. But we might want to add the qualifying homeschool student will live or will reside in Clearwater County and must be enrolled. Well, I, I def definitely think that should be added, but the way it's worded, it says a homeschooling association or board acting in Clearwater County. And I know the two different boards or programs that my daughter was with were boards that were outside of the county. And I actually, I can only think of one homeschooling. Um, it, it may, things have maybe changed over the years, but um, the only board I could think within Clearwater County is kind of the homeschooling that is offered through uh, the high school here, which is not really true homeschooling. It's affiliated with the uh, I guess the public school system. So how could we change that to make it more clear then? Would putting, because well, I, do you, I am thinking that acting in Clearwater County is vague enough, or vague enough, it might be the wrong word, but it's open enough that if they have a student in here, they're acting, perhaps a comma after association and board. So it's their acting, what is, is it the word acting that's your concern, Councillor Lang? Or what exactly is your concern? It is the, yeah, acting. I think it should be open to any homeschooling student that lives in Clearwater County, regardless of where they are um, registered through. That's the beauty of homeschooling. Yes. And I, so you, your understanding is that acting in Clearwater County does not define, would limit some homeschool students from applying for it? Absolutely. Okay. Um, other comments? Uh, Councilor Lahi? Just for a bit of clarification on point three, it says uh, enrolled in an approved program. Who's approving the program then, I guess would be my question. Uh, is it Alberta Education or is it some other entity that's approving it or is it us? Um, so I guess just a bit of clarification on what an approved program would be. Well, I think we should have Alberta Education approved homeschooling program because any boards that are uh, authorized with the government or approved by the government to act within the province would be an approved homeschooling program. So can we add the words Alberta Education Approved Homeschool Program? Um, yes. 
And also add the wording uh, for a student that resides within Clearwater County. Uh, just for clarification, uh, because I believe it is already in the policy under uh, the third bullet under number five, it indicates, it says, must have been a resident of Clearwater County at the time of high school graduations. Note, students who uh, were residents of the town or village do not qualify. So I believe it's covered there. Uh, I don't know if we need to put it in both places. So. Thank you. So we'll strike it from... We'll strike off resides in Clearwater County from item three. So Councillor Lang, instead of the word acting, can you think of a different word that would mitigate your concerns? Or because we say it's an Alberta education homeschool program, does that? I think that's mitigate? good enough. Does it end it? Put a period after Alberta Homeschool Program, period. Okay, so the qualifying homeschool student must be enrolled in an Alberta Education Approved Homeschool Program, period. We need a red light for you, Mr. Ramos. Um, would council consider perhaps moving that period up behind board so that it includes a statement and registered with a homeschool association or board? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Have your concerns been met, Councillor Lang? Yes, they have. Thank you. Are there any other comments about this policy? So administration is asking that we approve the new Clearwater County post-secondary scholarship policy as amended. Would someone care to make that motion? Councillor Lang, further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, motion carries. Item 7.2, support for David Thompson Play Schools relocation. Mr. Emmons. Thank you, Revolven, Council. So agenda 7.2. Uh, is in relation to support for David Thompson's play school relocation. So the staff recommendation is that council considers options to assist in the relocation of the, of the David Thompson play school. The background on this agenda, this play school was established in 1977. The David Thompson play school is a play-based, licensed, not-for-profit community play school for children ages three to five. The play school runs from September to the end of May, Monday through Thursday, and is governed by a volunteer board. On February 19th, 2020, the county was approached by Allison Casey, the president of the David Thompson Play School, for assistance in relocating the play school during the building phase of the Condor School. The play school is currently located in a portable on the north side of the existing Condor School. The building is owned by the play school. The county has been informed that the portable must be moved from the Condor site by June of 2020. The play school is looking for assistance in A, finding a piece of land on which the portable could be moved to, or B, finding a new building that would fit their needs either temporarily or permanently. The play school would like to stay close to the Condor School, but it's unclear at this time if the new school plans will include an area for them to use. It is staff's understanding that the play school has funds available through fundraising to help with its relocation. Some options that have been brought up for discussion are, number one, looking at the feasibility of rezoning existing municipal reserve in Condor, 
as to accommodate the play school. Number two, researching existing vacant building sites in Condor that might be converted. Number three, checking on vacant lots that may be for sale. Number four, looking to see if the local amenities such as the community hall may have room for a temporary location. Staff are seeking direction from council as to how the county may offer its support in this regard. So the school division's plan to close Condor and Leslieville and move all students to David Thompson for September 1st is still the current plan? Have they made any revisions to that? Do we know? The, the school board's current plan to close Condor and Leslieville, move all students to David Thompson for September 1st, that still is the plan? Or has that changed recently? So not as far as we know. Okay. The last plan that we heard, that was... Another the microphone, time. please. Sorry. And please introduce yourself, so, because people might not be able to see you on the live stream. Sorry. Uh, Matt Martins, the Director of Agriculture and Community Services. Comments or insights, Council? Councilor Lahey. Well, I, I, I just might start by adding or saying that this uh, uh, playground pro or play school program has been um, very efficient at uh, um, kind of reversing the trend of, of um, a declining population in, in the elementary schools. I think it creates a, a great program. So it certainly has value within the community. Um, and I can report, I reached out to the community center uh, uh, executive and uh, they had been approached on uh, a temporary uh, use of the community center for um, play school classes and they're, they're receptive to that. They haven't been approached on moving moving the, the existing facility, so I think that would require a little deeper level of discussion there, but I can report on that, so. Councillor Lang. Laird. Laird, I apologize. Our names are similar. <laughs> this new, the new setup, I'm confused today, it's rather oh, embarrassing. Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Martinson will be able to help us with this. Uh, is the current uh, portable that they're using um, vintage uh, 1977 as well? Because uh, that may create some additional challenges for potentially moving it. And um, have they got opportunities um, for you know, other future options working with the uh, Wild Rose School Division? I, I think that'd be nice to have just a little bit more understanding of kind of what their options are and what we know. Yeah, we've had some of those discussions. Um, to start with, their, their portable is older, um, but I believe it was, it was, they acquired it after uh, some uh, past modernization, um, maybe in the late 90s. Uh, but in their opinion, it is movable. Um, we haven't certainly assessed that, but, but that's their opinion. Um, as far as, as Wild Rose's future vision for them, we, we have asked them, of course, you know, things were up in the air um, when we had discussed, you know, this with them in the past, uh, prior to, to, to the recent developments, but they, they did suggest that there was a future for them in Condor as far as, as kind of uh, uh, operating from that location in the future, but they, they, they need to go now by September and they would need to replace that portable. But there was some some discussion that they could be one of the groups uh, that could access one of the new portables that would be brought to David Thompson to accommodate the initial um, repopulation of David Thompson for less than Concord to build. So again, everything was very preliminary so we could gather enough information for council to make a decision whether this was something the county wanted to help out with or not. Um, and at that point, we can do some further 
uh, investigation on what some options are specifically. We've also talked with them about, you know, their ideal future location and, and, and ultimately being outside of the hamlet really doesn't work for them. I mean, they were gracious and able to, you know, listen to any help we were able to give them, but they really wanted to, to stay in Condor um, as kind of their, you know, their second priority would be to keep their portable because it is set up right now for them. They were more open to moving out of their portable but staying in, in the hamlet. But if, you know, their, their top two wishes, um, you know, when we asked them were to stay in Condor and ultimately stay in their, their portable. But their portable needs full service hookup, gas, electricity, sewer and water. Um, and that's maybe not as easy to find in Condor as, as one might think, but um, we, we have some, some thoughts for options and if council wishes to pursue this, we, we do some more, uh, some more investigation and bring back some viable options for council's choice. Councillor Duncan. Um, and I think I would agree with that. I don't really have enough information here. I, I would, to me, the first, the best temporary solution would be to add another portable to David Thompson for the, while this new school is being built with the hope that they could relocate back to the Condor site if that's feasible. And, and perhaps it's even feasible to, uh, or maybe they don't wish to, but be the con new Condor school might be able to accommodate that play school as well. I, I don't know if that would ever be in the cards or not. But that's, and he, like I say, my suggestion for the temporary would be to, to exist at David Thompson while the new site's being developed. I don't think you're, I think you're correct. You wouldn't find a site in Condor with the full hookups that's suitable for temporary. Councillor Lang, or uh, Mr. Marks. I do have some quest answers to those questions. We, we did ask about accommodating that portable in the grand plan of David Thompson. Um, Wild Rose's uh, consultants are suggesting they're servicing there. It's gonna be maxed specifically the gas and the electricity. So they're worried about the amount of additional portables they need to facilitate existing condor unless they build school children. So they are not able to facilitate an additional portable at David Thompson. We have reached out to the Friends of the Corridor and asked if this play school was something they would accommodate um, kind of within their, their plans. But it is kind of really outside of their mandate, which is to focus within the school. Because this has to operate during the same school hours, it's different than say a, a child minding service where you could drop the kids off early from school and pick them up later and have a, a service within the school. Um, typically play schools, from what our understanding, aren't necessarily operate within the school. They're not the best fit that way. So we, we were we were approaching the Friends of the Corridor to find out if this would be a cause they would champion a part of their regular and it doesn't sound like it fits with their mandate. So I, I don't I hope that maybe answers some of some of Councillor Duncan's questions as we kind of had some of those same thoughts and, and had those same discussions. Um, and unfortunately the, the David Thompson site's just gonna be taxed uh, um, from what from our understanding is. Councillor Lang. Yeah, I was just going to add a bit more to what Councillor Duncan had said. I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe this portable was an old teacherage that used to be located at David Thompson just to the west. There was a play school there just to the west of the high school, sort of up on the ridge. My kids went there, so I know that. Um, back in the early 1990s. So I think this may be the same building that was actually moved to Condor. And so I'm just thinking there is utility hookups there just to the west of the, of the high school at David Thompson. So I'm kind of surprised by them saying that it's taxed and that they could not accommodate this because that was my first thought to put it back where it originally came from. I don't, I think that original teacher was condemned because of mold, and that's why they had to move it from David Thompson to Condor. But it's a, it, they moved the play school, but the old building was condemned. Because I think my son was in the play school when it was condemned at that time. Yeah, if I can just shed a little light too. Absolutely, David Thompson play school was originally on that 
David Thompson site, of course, there were some compromises with the, there were a number of um, teacher uh, residences on that, on that site and they were all eventually um, phased out and of course that was one of the victims of that. And the uh, play school, I believe, had um, kind of a semi-donation of these uh, ATCO type portable trailers that they have now and that's where the origins of that was and, and then they um, repurposed them for for that uh, spot at the um, Condor Elementary School site in about the time you're speaking of in the late 90s. Councillor Vandermeer. Yes, um, interesting options here. Uh, from what I've heard, this site where the play school used to be at David Thompson, uh, from, my, from what I understand from Councillor Lang, the utility hookups must still be there. So to me, that would seem like an option. Also, in the discussion from Mr. Martinson, the, uh, the community center as a temporary solution could be a, a, an option to leave it in the uh, hamlet of Condor. So this discussion seems to me a little premature. There's a lot of fluidity, a lot of changes are going to take place here in the next few months. And although they would like to have something firm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we have enough information to, uh, to really uh, uh, define how we could in some way be of assistance. But there, there seems to be some options available, the community center and the uh, and the, the old site at David Thompson. So I'd like to see those things investigated a bit before we, uh, uh, we come back to this at some later date, maybe. So if, we, if everyone can look at page 60 of 127, some options that have been brought up for discussion. Look at the feasibility of rezoning existing municipal reserve. Research the existing vacant buildings in Condor that may be converted. Check in on vacant lots that may be for sale and looking to see if local amenities such as the community hall may have room for a relocation. My guess is that the number one problem is the lack of funds for the play school to move the building themselves. So it's not so much of what they can do, but the question is how much is the county willing support? Is that a fair assessment of the situation? Yeah, I would say so. Um, in discussion with the group, they do have some funds. Obviously, they have to pay their teacher, they buy supplies, and um, um, so on and so forth. So they, they do have some limited capacity, but of course they're they're not. It's not going to be helpful to them to spend all their their resources on moving this and not have not be able to to, to uh, pay for a teacher. Uh, so that's that's kind of a, a fair assessment. I did want to clarify one point as far as the available physical hookups at David Thompson. You're absolutely correct. What we're lacking is actual capacity. So. The, the gas line there, um, even though we've got extra connections, when we add additional portables um, that, are, that are way less efficient, now we don't have enough gas. So it's not necessarily the physical connection and, and nobody's necessarily willing to put in new servicing for a temporary situation. Same with, with the size of the, the, the transformer there. It's not necessarily that there's not those connections. And that was, that was how it was explained to us by school division, not necessarily the, the availability of, uh, and, and that's assuming that those connections weren't necessarily reclaimed over there at the kindergarten. But that was, because that was, uh, again, we were very interested in that, that possibility, even though it's not ideal to have everybody mashed into one site. We, we felt like many, you know, if it came from there at one point, maybe it could go back there temporarily. And so for that reason, I, I don't believe we'll have any um, success going back to school division, re-proposing re that potential. I mean, we certainly can um, do anything council, council uh, directs, but uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, as the Reeve pointed out, those are some of the most viable options should council wish uh, for us to further investigate this, um, that those, those are the most uh, uh, viable options that we were able to identify based on the, the uh, minimal investigation we did uh, initially. Councillor Lair. I guess uh, for me, there's a couple things that are coming out of this conversation. Uh, my first observation is uh, Wild Rose School Division obviously has some of their own plans about potentially moving more portables uh, to accommodate the two schools 
uh, I'll say three schools into the one site, and it sounds like they can't necessarily accommodate this additional uh, portable. The next observation I would make, it sounds like this portable may be a bit of a challenge uh, of moving around, and yes, that would be a preference. So it really boils down to me, the first question is, does this council want to assist, yes or no? And I, I sense we do in the room. Um, that'll, I think that's question number one. And then that would lead then, if we do, to asking staff to get additional information so that we can figure out how to go forward. Uh, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I think that we first need to decide, do, do we feel that it's necessary to help, yes or no? Then I think it would allow staff then to work with that group and figure a way forward that would work f for a few options. Um, and I will say I am supportive of helping this group personally. Councillor Zayn. Thank you, Councillor Lear. That's where some of my thoughts were. Um, I'm thinking we need to um, find like how they want us to help. Do they want us to purchase land or do they want us to pay for the, the move of this um, portable? Um, they haven't given us a specific ask. If it is to pay for the move, I think we need some more information from administration to find out exactly what it's going to cost to move this portable. And I think it's kind of up to them to find out, to determine where they want to put it. Councillor Lougheed. And I guess just, just that kind of leads me uh, to a question for, for Mr. Martinson. In, in your uh, researching prog process here, I notice you have said uh, something about municipal reserves and other, maybe other available lands, undeveloped lands within, within Condor, or perhaps even um, lands that are under tax recovery or anything like that as potential sites. Maybe you could outline some of the uh, potential sites within, within the hamlet. I know I've had the feedback in the past that there are basically no, um, no um, there's no available uh, space for further development within Condor uh, up to this point. So it would be nice to know what, what your research has come up with. We've, we've, done, we've done some of that. There is some available um, land both zone currently municipal reserve or agriculture adjacent to the old railway unserviced but um, servicing could be handled and managed temporarily with a propane tank and a, a cistern rather than a full type connection obviously we'd need power and uh, some sort of water access, but servicing doesn't necessarily have to be natural gas and uh, a connection to a, uh, um, uh, you know, the lagoon connection in Conway, force main. Um, so we, the next step would be to look at um, that access with public works, but those are, those are some of the uh, options right now related to county available land. Also, there's the community hall. And of course, we, we haven't approached them formally because we needed to know if council wished us, you know, to, to, to do more work. And it, it's sounding like you do, um, you know, we'll, we'll wait for the resolution at the end, but we believe that's an opportunity as well. They have some strong existing amenities there that could support this with a fenced in backyard and a, a, a sort of a playground. It also gets us closest to the existing playground, which is gonna be important to utilize that for as long as we can before ultimately the school division um, has to remove some or restrict access. But it's likely that the, the good chunk of the playground will be available during construction uh, for the play school and they do plan on continuing to utilize it if they can, uh, which is important to play school. You know, uh, so, so walking all the way from essentially the old fire hall or, or the, the railway would not be necessarily ideal, but it's doable um, shuffling across the road from the community hall. Now, the, the other option is also within the community hall facility itself. Now, that creates some challenges for operations by the community hall, and ultimately this would be up to them. But th those are likely the, the avenues that administration would head directly towards if council turned us loose on this file. Um, and, and yes, we would sit down and ask for specific 
um, what if the county is willing to help, what would you need from a prioritized perspective? Would it be access to land, money, help with the move, all the above? Um, we, we would ask those questions from, from them as well and, and try to work with them to, to, to solve this and solution this problem. Councillor Vandermeer. Yes, uh, Councillor uh, Laird asked the uh, important question, do we support the group? And uh, that was followed up by Councillor Lang's comment about how much and, uh, and uh, where would they want to locate. And uh, those are important questions. Um, I also would be interested in supporting this group, but this is not a county project. Uh, I, I think we have to pay attention to some of our history in how we support groups. And uh, uh, generally what we do is we give them a helping hand once they define the scope and, uh, and costs and they come to us and we give them a percentage. And I would uh, point to an interesting project that was brought last year with the movement of the, the church uh, near Dover Court over to the museum at Caroline. And uh, that group wanted help uh, moving it, but they ultimately found uh, a private entity that really donated all of or most of that move and uh, uh, anyway, they, they came and, uh, and worked on a solution when, when uh, directed to do so. After, after the first approach to the county, they went back and uh, worked hard and came to a very good solution. So I would, uh, I would uh, think it is not really our, uh, our uh, community affairs uh, department's responsibility to do this investigation. I would like to see the community group that sponsors this activity do their own homework, identify what it is they want to do, what is the best solution for them, and can they get by for this next year while the, or more, while the schools are in, in limbo, in flux, can they find a temporary solution that is low cost and uh, and uh, can get the job done until the, uh, the complete school site at Condor is, uh, is confirmed. So uh, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to see them do the, do the legwork on this. Councillor Lang. Yeah, Councillor Vandermeer brought up some good points and I had also thought of that once we help one group, it can open up a can of worms and we can keep getting ask after ask after ask. Um, I, would, I, I would like to help this group and I'm not sure if we're able to as a municipality, but um, they don't have a lot of time to raise the funds to move. So I would consider helping them if they needed a, a loan uh, that could be paid back. I'm not sure if the municipality can do that and maybe our CAO can answer that question. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can see this leading to many asks down, down the road. I'd also, I'm not sure if Matt is able to find this out, but when this play school started, I'm, I'm just kind of curious as to what funds they started with. Was it a group that raised the funds or did they come uh, get municipality dollars when they started or dollars from the school division? It would be kind of interesting to find that out. So mo most of their um, um, funding comes from uh, user fees from using the service. They're, they are a, a private, not-for-profit society. Um, they do get grant funding for some special programming right from Alberta Education. They call that their PUFF grant. Um, so they're, they're, um, they're, they're getting, you know, they have a, a, a kind of a, that two-stream resource, you know, for, through... Alberta Education because they are providing a, 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 an education-based service. It's not necessarily child care. It's not just a child care service, though that's a secondary you know, service. They are providing that early education opportunity. But uh, no, their initial um, portable came through fundraising and uh, um, user, user fee services and um, 
yeah, they, they were planning on doing a bit of a fundraising push here. Obviously, that's been cancelled, um, like any other community groups fundraising. Um, but um, that's kind of how they're they're collecting their their resources now. Okay, uh, Councillor Laird. The second part was not. Yes, Councillor Knight. So the second part of my question was an answered, and that was if our if the municipality can give a loan. Mr. Emmons. Because they're a not for profit. Mr. Emmons, could you please speak into a microphone for the live stream? Because they're a not for profit, my understanding of the municipal government act is we could. Um, we would go through a process and validate that, but I believe at this time we, we could extend. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Laird, then Deputy Reeves Swanson, and then we need to have a motion. That's precisely what I want to aim at doing. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Martinson, for indicating that, you know, that there is grants that they're currently accessing. Um, the puff grant is probably very much like every other grant it goes away in a puff um, So it's quickly used up um, And they have to use it for their programming So um, it's good to have the clarification that we could potentially create a loan option given that time is of the essence They need to make this move by June so I agree with the comments that have been made around uh, around this table that um, this is largely uh, something that we want to support. However, the legwork is uh, predominantly needing to be done by that group. So my motion would be that uh, our council supports the Condor Play School and directs staff um, to ask the group to determine a scope of project and future op options for that support. Perhaps there's some suggestions on how we could better word my motion. Tracy, can you repeat the motion, please? Um, could I have Councillor Lear repeat that motion, please? The Council supports Condor Play School and directs staff to ask the group to determine scope of project and future options for that support. Deputy Reeves Swanson. Um, I agree with your, your motion, but I just wanted to just add something, and this is more for the councils, so the councillors that are on FCSS. And we understand that through FCSS there are multiple, as I used to be on there, uh, multiple groups uh, that have, play groups that have come to FCSS and asking for financial assistance, but it didn't fall within the FCSS mandate. But looking at that, I know that, um, they did turn to the town council, and town council did grant them smaller uh, funding, um, smaller increments and that kind of thing, and that might be something that uh, we could ask the town in regards to that, because I know it would be in smaller dollar amounts, I think $500 or something like that. But anyways, I know that the, through the municipality, uh, they have assisted different groups on for different options of that, and not saying that this is something, um, I agree that we should, with Council Yard, we, we are interested in helping. I am uh, interested in helping this group, but um, there are other play groups in and around. Yes, out, they are the main one out in our municipality, but there are some within the town boundary that um, uh, could be, um, it, it's much needed service, I guess. And so for me, it's like, uh, we can't compare apples and apples, or we have to, we can't compare apples and oranges. We just gotta make sure that we're within our scope and um, in helping this. And this, this doesn't um, preclude the fact that we are assisting Wild Rose School Division with the fact of moving our force mains and things like that to assist in their building of the new schools as well. So it is an indirect and uh, I believe that we can help. But any clarification from the councillors on the FSSS end of it, that uh, would be great. Councillor Lang. Uh, Lang. Uh, yes, so I was at the FCSS meeting, I guess a month ago, and uh, they do not have any funding left. We have many more asked than what there is left for dollars and uh, I think the last two sessions no one has got their their amount that, they, that they've asked for. 
um, also it came to the attention of the board, and I believe it will be coming to this council. There's been some budgeting through the town, and um, there's going to be an ask coming back to the county to reimburse FCSS some dollars. So I don't have all the details, but there's been maybe an error there or, or something with the town, and I don't want to say an error until we get all the details, but um, there's no dollars in FCSS right now. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lougheed, you did have your light on for a minute. Um, actually, yeah, I, I just confer with uh, Councillor Lang's um, or Laird's motion in that I think their meet to this group's uh, immediate need is moving that structure. That's their, their main asset, and I think uh, assistance in moving that off and finding either a permanent home or at least helping with uh, some sort of financing for their, uh, their uh, move over the next uh, few months here um, might, be, might be the line of action. Councillor Duncan. Uh, I, I would agree. I think that's the, the direction to take here is to, is to find the options available for moving it and temporary options if they exist for the next year. The FCSS did support some play schools many years ago, but that's kind of fallen out of the mandate. Also, you referred to some of the smaller grants that the town, the town has a program right now that just about any community group can come to them for $500. And, and I, so I think that's where some of that is, is there, is showing up. It's not really sp specific to anyone, you know, trying to, f to catch groups that are falling through the cracks, but that any group can apply there. So. Tracy, could you reread re the motion? that council considers uh, supporting Condor Play School and directs staff to consult with the group to inquire on project scope plans and additional options for the relocation of Condor Play School. Any further discussion on the motion? Councillor Lane. I'm just, I'm just wondering if Councillor Liard would um, consider adding a, what I would say a friendly amendment um, to the latter part, and if um, basically asking if the group would consider a loan, a uh, help in, in the form of a loan. Councillor Laird? I thought I left it open enough that that would be one of the options that we could have as a consideration without including it and, and locking it into our motion. So I wasn't sure that it's really needed. They can certainly ask and then we can direct staff at that time was my intent. Okay. So we'll leave the motion as it is. I will ask the question. All in favor? Motion carries. We will have a brief recess. The presentation at 1015, or the delegation at 1015 needs a little time to set up. So we will come back at, uh, let's say 1020. Does, is that enough time? So we'll be back at 1020.
We'll turn on the live stream. It is 1021. We'll call the meeting back to order. We need to have uh, item 6.1, 10.15 a.m. Clearwater County Taxpayers Association, Marianne Cole, President, and Helgi Nome. We need to have a motion. Can someone... We need to have a motion that states that council authorizes Clearwater County Taxpayer Association's delegate Helgi Nome participation in council's March 24th, 2020 regular meeting via speakerphone. Can someone please make that motion? I would so move. Councillor Lougheed, all in favor? Motion carries. Marianne. Well, good morning, everyone. Is this on? I must sincerely thank all of you, first of all, for this special consideration in allowing me to come here today to publicly make this presentation in light of the current COVID-19 situation. We know that plans came forward in 2018 following two public meetings. At that time, the public expressed a sincere desire to maintain two stations. Consequently, Council moved forward to accommodate those wishes. Minutes from the August 28th Council meeting indicate that the project overview suggested the new Condor Public Services building would have five bays for an estimated cost of $4 million. And Leslieville would have three bays at a cost of $2,157,938. After discussion, a motion made by Councillor Swanson stated that Council receives the project overview for Leslieville and Condor fire stations for information as presented and approves the project overview for Leslieville and Condor fire stations as presented and schedules further discussion on project costs for Leslieville and Condor fire stations during 2019 budget deliberations. Carried 6 to 1. Plans were supported, work began, and we realized the completion of an excellent facility in the fall of 2019. Move fast forward to January 20th, 2020, and the Strategic Planning Council Committee of the Whole. This was the first time we became publicly aware of the potentially significant change in plans the purchase of 27.43 acres of land and the possibility of a five-bay facility. And the large increase in costs. If we look at the 2020-21 budget figures, we note that every one of the listed costs is higher than Condor, except for the equipment, which is the same. The overall budget total for Leslieville is $1,317,000 higher. And if we go through the, each one of the costs for the Leslieville Public Services building, the land, $203,000 higher. Site design construction, $1,014,000 higher. The building itself, $100,000 higher than Condor's. And that results in an overall total increase of $1,317,000 more than Condor. If we look at the original figures from 2018, ones that were passed by Council, the building cost for the construction of a three-bay facility was $1,000,000 $29,250. The new current budget cost, as we saw on the previous page, of $3,500,000 for the building alone is $2,470,750 higher. Now, you figure in the increased cost from the previous page, you have the budgeted total, as we saw, of $5,620,000. 2.6 times the original total. All this, when Council approved a plan 
that Leslieville was to be a less costly satellite station. How can an original motion not be followed? When was another motion made for such a drastic change? I draw, now draw your attention to some key comments by councillors at the January meeting. First of all, Councillor Swanson said she was okay with three bays in Leslieville, but the whole admin side is a concern. Is it necessary? We could bare bones that and eliminate the kitchen. I wholeheartedly agree. 6,000 square feet for admin slash staffing use is huge. Consider that a very comfortable family home with three bedrooms, two and a half baths, and adequate living, dining, kitchen facility can be built in 500 square feet or less. This proposal would be the equivalent of four such houses. And there is a suggestion for two such facilities within 11 kilometers of each other. That is the equivalent of eight staff houses in very close proximity. This is completely unnecessary. At the bottom of this page, Councillor Vandermeer states that he is concerned why there is a suggestion of four pieces of equipment when we only need two, and goes on to state that the new plans are totally unacceptable. Further, he mentions the purchase of eight acres in Condor with the idea of a potential training centre there. Actually, the whole idea of a training centre is questionable with many unanswered questions of viability, which I will address later. Then there is the need, or lack thereof, for the two extra bays in Leslieville. Towards the bottom of this page, Councillor Lang asked the question, is anything stored in the Public Works building? Mr. Hansen from Public Works replies that yes, sprayers and ag equipment are. Councillor Lang then suggests that we have something that serves the need for storage. So Mr. Hansen replies, yes, that is not a need at this time. Going on, Councillor Laird goes on to note the importance of fire halls to the community. They are a fabric of the community, the shining beacons. She goes on to suggest that they could include a reception centre and operation centre. People could go there in an emergency and feel safe. I might counter that with, the suggest with that suggestion that we have very welcoming community halls in each centre with excellent kitchen facilities. In the end, a motion was made by Councillor Swanson that the RFP be postponed until further information on the conceptual design is received from an administration. The vote was carried unanimously. Throughout the discussion, there were unanswered questions about costs, most notably related to the training facility and the need for extra bays. I certainly agree that there is a crucial need for more information. Even in the agenda package today, the information presented on the site design and grading plan related to phase two is incomplete, and I quote, future con concrete surfacing of the fire training area, the fire training tower, and paving of the access road are not included. I also note that phase two consists of work on 12 acres for the training area. This area is five acres larger than phase one, yet the cost is smaller. How does that compute? Further on in today's information, there are descriptions of project plans one, two, and three. Each of the plans deals with the grading plan along with the advertising for an RFP for the proposed building, be it a three or five bay facilities. Cost estimates for plans one and two are provided but no cost is given for Plan 3. Plan 3 does, however, give the option for Council to, quote, redesign the building to a configuration agreed to by Council and advertise the RFP. No suggestion is made as to what the potential redesign might be, and absolutely no costs are indicated. 
Without these costs, it presents an incomplete budget comparison of the three proposals. And I wonder how council can justify supporting anything when they do not know how many taxpayer dollars will be spent. It is great to have the option to redesign the facility, but a cost estimate must be presented before council approves advertising for an RFP. The following pages include comments and questions from the Leslieville meeting. In the essence of time, I will just move through these pages on the comments from that as the totals are summarized later. Certainly there have been heard Certainly concerns have been heard over the need for two fire halls in such close proximity, and so I've put together some figures on that. Looking within our county, there are areas between Rocky and Caroline and Rocky and Nordegg that are significantly farther away from any fire hall. If you look at other jurisdictions that surround Clearwater County, the distance between fire halls, except for Lacombe to Black Falls, is always greater than the distance between the two that we are dealing with. Then we look at the additional costs, which I've also already gone through most of them. And uh, except for the concern about the uh, information from Wild Rose and the potential uh, partner for the training facility, I find it particularly frustrating that no information is forthcoming on these partnerships, especially the training facility stakeholder. The suggestion for this training cooperation was hinted at late last year. Almost three months have passed and there has been absolutely no information. How credible is a potential partner who won't even come excitedly forward with their novel idea? Going on to training facility costs. $500,000 have been set aside in the 2021 budget for phase two, which includes a potential training facility. Currently, new recruits are trained by certified, by certified staff, in-house instructors at our current facilities. So there's no need for a new facility for that. Extra training is done at a facility in Red Deer at a rental cost of $1,400 per day without an engine or $1,800 with an engine for an average of $1,600 per day. Information gathered from a local volunteer suggested that our firefighters might use that facility about three times per year for a total cost of $4,800 per year. At that rate, it would take about 100 years to recoup the $500,000 cost in next year's budget not including the extra site design construction costs from this year. If we go on to look at some pictures, we see that other areas are adequately served by facilities that are much more conservative. At the bottom of this page, you see a picture of the Drayton Valley facility. Several pieces of equipment in a large shed type structure servicing a town of about 7,000 people and a surrounding area similar to ours. The Bentley Fire Hall. Note the size. It is 1,280 square feet smaller than the original satellite facility proposed for Leslieville, but it has three drive-through bays and adequate staff quarters. A perfectly functional facility for a town of 1,078 people along a busy highway and close to a very large number of acreages, summer lots, and camping at Gull Lake. The nearest station for support or assistance is at Lacombe, 23 kilometers away. Station 2 in the county of Strathcona, South Cooking Lake facility. It serves the hamlet of 240 people as well as numerous acreages along Highway 14. Note that it is also a satellite office for the RCMP, special constables, and bylaw officers, 
in the area, and it is 40 years old. Station 3, also in Strathcona County, in the hamlet of Ardrossan, population about 500. Note, this 43-year-old facility encourages 25 part-time members. Going on to look at rebuttals for the information that has been used uh, to justify the, uh, the uh, fire hall building in Leslieville. During discussion at recent meetings, justification for a larger facility focused on the following rationale. Number one, it makes more financial sense to build bigger now than have to add on later. To that I reply, there has been a steady decline in population in the county since 2014. With that decrease, there is no need to overextend the size of a facility. Also, the physical area size of the county is not going to change, so the number of pieces of equipment for public services and ag should not increase either. Currently, there is adequate storage for this at Condor and the public services building south of Leslieville. With the recent purchase of the building east of the co-op in Rocky Mountain House, additional space has been freed up at the admin building. There is no need for more storage space. Above all, there is questionable validity to the argument that building bigger than necessary is ever financially beneficial. I also really question the comments in today's agenda package, which states, and I quote, there were varying opinions on whether the building should be a three bay or five bay build, with the majority seeming to agree with council's vision of being future ready and planning to meet future community needs by constructing a 50 to 80 year building. Again, with questionable population increases, and no size increase for the county, why the increase in community needs. Furthermore, in all the communications I've had with the great, with, I've had, the great majority do not agree with the future ready vision. Going on to number two. With a training facility, we could generate rental revenue from other jurisdictions. As I said earlier, there is a centralized facility in Red Deer, as well as one at Troshu. It is highly questionable who would drive out here with additional time and mileage cost, where there are also no amenities such as hotels or restaurants here to service extended training sessions. Number three, with a training facility, we could encourage potential new recruits and or offer additional credit opportunities for high school students. First of all, encouragement for new recruits could be done by hosting a special event during Fire Prevention Week. This could be a, a fun part day session at very minimal cost. Paid on call firefighter to act as a facilitator and some potential treats or prizes. As for offering credit opportunities, that is not a municipal responsibility. Furthermore, how would that be managed? Would there be a paid, qualified, part-time, full-time instructor? At what cost? Number four. We currently have the money from MSI grant and money from, received from Helping Fight Fires in Fort McMurray in British Columbia. Just because we have the money does not mean that we have to spend it on unnecessary expenditures. The MSI money could be used for other county project expenses. With the possible amalgamation with Caroline, the potential for modernizing that facility is very real. It might be wise to save some money for that. Number five, we want to maintain a safe community. The safety of a community is not dependent on the size of a fire hall. It is dependent on the quick response times by all first responders, police, fire, and ambulance. Number six, 
We want to build communities. The size of a fire hall has absolutely nothing to do with attracting people to an area. According to research, the five top reasons given for how people choose where to live were, and I must say it was very, very difficult to find information on this. And I did find information from those two that are listed there on Google. I even phoned the Alberta Real Estate Association and they did not have figures on that. So you can see money crashes said affordability was number one, then taxes, employment opportunities, real estate values, and crime rates. Investopedia, centrality, pleasing neighborhood with amenities, development potential in their schools, hospitals, and public transportation, lot location, and the house itself. I would suggest in this current economic atmosphere, the most important considerations in our area would be, number one, price, employment opportunities, proximity to such amenities as stores, schools, and hospitals, and high-speed internet. Going on to public opinion. Throughout the various public engagement opportunities, the meeting at Leslieville and the recent CCTA meetings, concern has been focused on the need versus want, as well as the necessity of the additional cost. At the Leslieville meeting, there were 37 questions addressed, and they related to the following concerns. Financial considerations, 14. Justification for present plan, 7. Lack of information, 4. Other, 12. Add the, the top two concerns together and you have 21 questions just for justification of plans. I have also received eight letters of concern and I have passed them on to Tracy Lynn and to council members. And in, again, in the essence of time, I will just note that the most uh, letters expressed a very serious concern with two fire halls in such close proximity when other areas have nothing and also the size was a concern as well. In summary, I want to say that generally, from what I've heard, the majority of taxpayers are not opposed to a new facility at Leslieville. In fact, they are very supportive of it. They are, however, very concerned about the size, coupled with the serious need for fiscal responsibility. In response to those concerns, there has been a lot of positive sounding rhetoric used to justify the loss of the larger facility. Hopefully, the earlier rebuttals substantiate that this smoosh talk lacks definite justification and is not reflective of the wishes of the majority of county taxpayers. Currently, we are in a very unfavorable economic climate provincially. The provincial government has been and will likely continue to download more and more responsibilities and costs onto municipalities. It is even questionable if MSI funding will continue after 2021-2022. Also, at present, our county is owed roughly $6 million in tax arrears. Consider now the future ramifications from this current COVID-19 pandemic. With all this, there is the potential for a very negative financial picture for the county. And it stresses an even greater need to be fiscally responsible. Before making any decisions, more complete figures must be provided on actual project expenses and the contributions of potential partners, stakeholders must be verified. The Leslieville Fire Hall project must be evaluated according to the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars in order to address needs, not wants. That can only be done with complete information. As Councillor Vandermeer stated in the January 20th strategic planning meeting, there is no urgency to build something out of scale. Finally, I want to say again, my sincerest thanks to Council and Administration for allowing us to present our case here today. While we may not always agree on issues, we want to note our deepest appreciation for the dedicated, cooperative, and congenial working relationship with our group and both Council and Administration. 
As a concluding statement, I draw your attention to the Municipal Government Acts Division 3, Duties, Titles, and Oaths of Councillors. General Duties of Councillors, number 153, states, and I quote, Councillors have the following duties. To consider the welfare and interests of the municipality as a whole. End of quote. I trust that guideline will be the determining factor in your decision. Thank you. We stand now for questions, or if Helgi had comments. Can we have Helgi speak? Yeah, for sure. Or is he waiting for the 30 second delay? Are there any questions for Marianne? Yes, Deputy Reeves Swanson. Okay. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, so uh, so just to, to lay this out, I'll do a presentation, just a straight presentation, and then if there are any questions back to me, someone actually has to repeat that question right into the telephone in your chamber. Otherwise, I can't hear it very well because of all the noise. So, so is that okay? Yes, I would just like to remind you that we normally only allow 20 minutes per delegation and we're already at about 26 minutes. I'm going to put you on my desk. Yeah, please. I just want to note, Helgi, that normally we only allow 20 minutes per presentation or per delegation and we're already we're at 26, so, but continue. Yeah, I, well, my, my, mine will be short and sweet. Okay. <laughs> And I'm very confident that all the other members of our association support that position as well. So we, we are speaking with one voice. And there is really no way that we can see how you can justify spending $10 million in the eastern part of the uh, county on two very large fire halls. It just does not make sense. It's as simple as that. In the meantime, the, the uh, fire hall in Caroline, has, which was constructed mostly by volunteer labor back in 1986, has not received any consideration at this stage. So um, I think we could easily divert some of those funds that you're planning to spend in Leslieville towards upgrading the uh, Caroline facility in due course. And the other thing I want to remind you of is that there will very probably be a considerable, uh, uh, you know, the, the tax revenues in the coming year will, 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 will be very short of what we're used to getting. So we might even have to transfer funds from our uh, capital reserves into operating just to keep the county going at the present level. So all of these things need to be taken into account before you decide what next steps to take. So I think that's it, that it is it in a nutshell for me. So if anybody would ask to, like to ask me a question, uh, maybe that could repeat, be repeated right into the phone that, that you have. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Any questions, uh, Deputy Reeves Swanson? Yes, my question is for Marianne. Uh, Marianne, how many members do you currently have? Well, it was, Usually we have from 25 to 30. Um, I haven't talked to Pat Butler exactly to get the number of membership members for this year. Okay. Thank you. But again, just as a comment, wondering and to add to Kelgi's comment, I did send copies of this uh, presentation to all of our board of directors. So they had it and made comments on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Lahi. Uh, sorry, I didn't have my... Oh. I, I, sorry about that. No apology necessary. Uh, Councillor Lang. Thanks. My question is for Marianne. Um, Marianne, you did not have time to read these letters you submitted, so I'm just wondering if you can give us a quick summary um, 
we haven't had time to read them either. Mm. And so also, uh, further to Deputy Swanson's question, are these letters that you received from, are they from tax member uh, association members or are they other members of the public? Okay, first of all, I should have written down all these questions, Teresa, but um, anyway, the letters are, uh, there was only one that came from a member of our association. The other letters come from the general public, and the majority of them express uh, a, a serious concern about the lack of fire halls in other areas, that there are, are other areas of the county with much greater population that do not have a fire hall this close. Marianne, on the, the second letter, or the sec, yes, the second letter does not have a name on it. Exactly. That person asked not to be included on that? Yes, yes. Okay. Any further questions for our two delegates? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to accept this information, uh, accept this presentation as information? I would so motion. Councillor Lougheed so moves. All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you both very much. Well, thank you guys. It's a huge thank you. Okay, and thank you, Helgi. I'm unsure of how to turn this off, Tracy. Okay. Yes, we will have a uh, seven minute recess and reconvene at 11 a.m.
11.04 and I call the meeting back to order. We are on item 7.3 on the agenda, appointment of Agricultural Service Board Chair. Mr. Martinson? Yes. Um, as you can see, the item is pretty self-explanatory, just a process procedural uh, um, uh, point that we need to, to meet current legislation and, and have our uh, chairman formally appointed that we've always uh, valued the opportunity for the Exeris Board to select the, their own chairperson. Um, so uh, at this point, it would be just a formality for council to confirm the, the board selection. And no term? No term, um, because we didn't really want to, we're, we're hoping we can stretch the, the, the legislation and not burden this uh, a body every time uh, we want to confirm this. We've traditionally had the long serving chair people. And so our proposal is just basically when the board changes. So if, if they choose at their yearly organizational meeting to make a change, at that point we would come to council for confirmation. But if they continue to reconfirm the same chairman as they traditionally do, then we would not come to council until a change is made. Just to make things more efficient and not sop up more time than needed. Any questions? Yes, Deputy Response. Um, Matt, can you tell me who the current vice chair is? Um, so our current chairman is, is um, Aaron uh, Turksma, and the vice chair is, um, that is a good question, Jim. Do you remember? It doesn't say. That's why I'm asking. It's Jody. It's Jody. That's right. They switched. Yeah, okay. Aaron was traditionally our our uh, our, okay. our our vice, and they've chosen to their own succession there, and and they've swapped. That's correct. Thank you, uh, Councilor Duncan. Do you happen to know how long Aaron's Aaron's term is? Is he in year one, two, or th should be just finishing his first term? Okay. So he'll be rolling. Uh, he'll be uh, uh, eligible for another term should council want to reappoint uh, okay. over the next year or two, I believe. Okay. Any further questions? If there are none, can someone please make a motion? So Councilor Duncan? Okay, so the staff recommendation. Effective November 22nd, 2019. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor? <coughs> Motion carries. Item 7.4, changes to the Alberta Parks system. Thank you. Um, I think Council's aware of this uh, as, as the uh, announcements came out at the start of March. Um, you know, picked up a lot of media attention. That was quickly overshadowed by uh, the current uh, situation. So um, it, it feels like a lifetime ago when we first heard about this, but, but it was early March when we were notified that there would be significant changes to um, the uh, environment parks process for running campgrounds uh, and uh, public recreation areas in our, our county and throughout the province. We've uh, done the assessment and we have established that 20 parks or PRAs have been slated for immediate closure, uh, both for full and partial. Um, partial, uh, uh, and, and then another 164 areas that have been identified for partnerships. Um, you know, we've, uh, I'm not gonna go through each, each site. You've got that uh, in your information and it's available on the website. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly some of these were not very, um, heavily used, uh, you know, they, the only amenities, like day use kind of areas at Cartier Creek and out of garbage can, it was basically a roadside turnout. It's probably not a huge loss. And then we have, you know, all the end, other end of the perspective, you know, Horberg PRA, um, Saunders PRA, those are, you know, uh, fairly well used areas. Saunders for launching canoes, you know, Horberg, um, just for general camping. Some of these might be in council or in, Administration's opinion, some of these might be strategic assets related to a rock and Nordic trail. So to better keep council informed and to preserve our ability to potentially be a partner, we've already applied 
uh, and got in the queue were prioritized very high um, as far as uh, being one of the, the first groups that will be contacted to discuss a potential partnership. We have not committed the county to anything but a discussion of what a partnership would look like. Um, and um, so that's, that's what we understand was slated for likely uh, early May, may not happen now. Uh, as far as the re release of that information, but when and if it when it does, we're going to be high on the list for for uh, a potential partnership. Um, beyond that, um, we just wanted to bring this information to council so that they were well aware and and, and should council uh, wish for us to to pursue further, uh, um, they can direct us uh, as such. Is there any questions? Deputy Reeves Swanson. Yes, Matt, I have a question and maybe Councillor Duncan can answer this too and, and that is in regards to our Bighorn Steering Committee, Friends of the Eastern Slopes. Are any of these parks listed in their, per day, uh, their volunteer use? And with, in regards to, I guess I, I would like more further clarification into uh, what the GOA or Park, Environment Parks is going to be is it just turning over the control to manage that or is it for a, a lease? But I would welcome some comments from either Councilor so Duncan or you. Go ahead. The, the one example I can give you would be the Elk Creek Fish Pond Provincial Recreation Area. That is one that Friends of These Slopes applied to, it was closed and they applied to the province several years ago to take that over and open it. And they also at that time wanted to make it into a quad friendly, horse friendly which was not allowed under the current uh, provincial regulations. That was approved, although when it came down to actual signage on it, the province did not allow them to go into They are managing it, okay. but they have not been allowed to make it quad friendly or horse friendly to date. So if they are still interested in that and they keep bugging the province about it, I would say that this is probably an avenue for them to finally get the control they want to, to make that one operate as it is. Um, that's the only example in, in here that I see I think that they're presently interested in. All the others are, and there's some big ones in there like jackfish, you know, 200 hectares is significant. Mm -hmm. And as Matt has pointed out, uh, the, the, the Horberg one is, you have to go through the Saunders Alexo potential node to get to the Horberg one. So there are significant ties there uh, to potential to the rail trail and Beaver Dam is the other one because the rail trail is right through the Beaver Dam uh, Provincial Recreation Area at the present time. I, there, I think as Matt has said, it's, I think that's probably a good move to get in the queue to have those discussions. Uh, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. They have indicated that the, the management and the designation of these can change so it could open. An example would be the Horberg site could become part of a node or something like that if we so choose because that's the from my indication, or the indication on the website is that's what you can do. I would still have significant questions about interest groups taking these over because we have to understand that if you take this over, does it become the exclusive of the mandate of that group? And for example, uh, could a quad only group take over one of these and not allow people that have mountain bikes to, to ride there? You know, there's, there's a whole host of things to work out. The other thing is they call it a partnership, but I would want to know about funding, if there's any funding that's going to go toward these as well. Um, there's a significant number of these that are, probably almost all of these are operated in terms of uh, manage, or not, maintenance through a couple groups from the county. So uh, I would think that there's, it's a struggle to, to make these uh, pay their own way. So it's, we have, we have significant considerations as a county to move forward on any of these at this time without you know, lots of questions. But I do think it's the right move to get on the list, mm -hmm. to be talking, and especially the ones that are in the, in the... There are some that are closed already, have been closed for a number of years. If somebody was wanting to open them up again, that's, I guess, up for consideration. But uh, okay. that would be my assessment to this point. Okay, follow-up? Yes. Um, so as you've indicated, um, you know, some groups are wanting to, like you say, the question will be on pay-per-use and things like that. So I guess for my question would be, 
in regards to development for the development if we did not become the I'll just say the ones managing it and another private or nonprofit group became the managing of it do you think that the uh, if there's further development I'm just just gonna say they add uh, electrical or something in that regards is that going to come to the county as far as the development permit or would that be just going as a mandate through the GOA if, if we were to take over management of the site and then third party out then it would be through us it would be my understanding I this planning would help us out with that bit. but if it's a uh, uh, existing site right now anything out there we are just a referral agency and basically goes to the roads going in there that sort of thing is if the effects on us so we're not part of the approval process unless it's in like I say an a area that we're recognized Nordic um, and I don't know if, I think that's is that fair Matt? yeah I, th I think so that we're not the development authority out there unless they've you know as we've uh, uh, discussed we you know we're pushing to have the nodes designated um, and part of that reason is so we can start planning uh, out there. Right, the exception would be, you know, the nodes. Um, now, keeping in mind, from the way we've proposed the nodes to, to lay out, the Saunders um, campground and PRA would be outside of our current node um, because we're, it's really located right at the river and it's a little walk-in campsite. Um, with a boat launch. So that, that may not be all that useful for the Rocky to Nordic Trail, but it might be very interesting for the canoe club. Um, it's our understanding based on past uh, uh, situations where they've done this, this in, uh, similar thing. We've seen that, that's how Cal Lake came to be part of uh, the county's um, campgrounds that we lease out to a, a community group, as well as Burnstick Lake and Clearwater Campground. They came to us in a similar fashion and uh, so th th this isn't new territory the the um, province has, has done this in the past and so um, we would look at them and, and right now they have a very I think it's a hundred dollars for a five-year lease it's very minimal we get all the revenue but have to pay all the expenses so I, I, I would expect even though we haven't seen any of the details yet and and uh, we're waiting for those details um, I would assume it would be very similar to that. We, they wouldn't be giving us a, a ridiculously long-term lease, nor would they be um, necessarily uh, requiring us to do any certain kinds of developments. But the, the question that, that Councillor Duncan and Councillor Swanson mused about regarding how much specialization, could we, uh, uh, say, access a beaver dam or a, ho uh, a harlock and utilize that as, a, as an amenity to our Rocky Nordic Trail. Those are some of the things we'll be discussing uh, when they do reach out because um, if that's the county's desire to have these amenities to support the trail, we need the ability to, to have access by the users of the trail. And maybe, um, even though it's a multi-use trail, maybe it is more appropriate to have a, a, a camping area specifically for one user and another camping area specifically for the other um, to try to manage some of the conflicts. So we're, we're gonna be having those discussions if, if council wishes us to, um, and then we can report back before council decides how much, if at all, we wanna get involved in this next round of campgrounds, campground downloading. You know, that's, that's really what we're talking about here. Councilor Duncan, a question? Um, no. My Councillor Lang. So last week I got a, a letter from a resident from Nordic, which I forwarded on to council. And as well, we received a letter from the Taxpayers Association, which was endorsed by that group. Um, there's concerns about the government pushing this through and uh, selling off these parklands without public consultation. So I responded to um, my constituent in Nordig and I told him that I would ask council to consider sending a letter to our government, perhaps the Minister of Parks and Recreation, uh, just ask for um, some public consultation um, that was um, voiced by the 
Albertans that there should be pub public participation and consultation when they propose the wildland park. And so I see no difference with this proposal and what they're trying to do now. So I just like to see what council feels and sending a letter to the minister and suggesting that proper public consultation be done with this proposal. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, so uh, thank you uh, to staff for taking that initiative. Um, I think it positions us well as a council, um, at least to have the option of, I would call first right of refusal. I think we, it gives us the opportunity to figure out what it is um, that the province is asking, what, uh, what the options are. I agree with Councillor Lang's uh, letter idea to Minister uh, Nixon and the provincial government with regard to uh, public consultation on this. I think that uh, our community would like that opportunity. My rationale uh, for looking at this, I guess, um, and having the opportunity for us to look at it is um, looking at whatever joint uh, county management partnerships might be options um, for a couple reasons. It controls the standard of access, not just for our, um, for our community and those who would be coming to tour and or recreate, it also allows us access for our emergency services because many of these are access points, including to the river uh, for rescue missions. Two, it allows us to have some, uh, some measure of control and or say in the care and the potential cost and future development of these, uh, these various sites. Back to us saying that we are an economic development council, I think this may be an opportunity that we need to at least explore while balancing what we consider a potential provincial download. So I think we need to understand it better, but I do, uh, do thank uh, our staff for taking the initiative and getting us in the queue so we can have a more informed decision. Councillor Duncan. Yeah, just further to Councillor Lang's question on I, I, think I would disagree, I think, with the term selling off. They're not going to be transferring title of these. Um, and I, I do wonder about the lack of, I wouldn't call it, I guess, public consultation. It's, I think when they are terminated a partnership here, that's how they're going to approach the consultation on this, is, is through the partnerships that they want. They're, they're not re relinquish, relinquishing the control of, these, of the land at this point. Um, like as Matt said, we have no idea what the lease would be or, or how they're going to approach this. They're, I think we're, we would be premature to start asking for public consultation at this point until we get a better idea of how much interest there is out there in taking any of these or managing any of these sites. Um, what I would not want us to see is that we just add another level of bureaucracy here where it goes province, county, somebody else managing or looking after a site. It, it, that adds a, because it, unless we are the ones that are going to be financially responsible for it, which we may or may not want to take on, just to add another level of bureaucracy to this whole system would not be to anybody's benefit either. So. Um, like I say, there's lots of good points to be made for access and, and emergency that will be provided from this county, but layering on more bureaucracy is, until we understand it, I guess, is like you said, is not the way to go either. So, okay, so the staff recommendation is that we receive the update on Alberta Parks restructuring plans for information. There is also, uh, along with that, I think, what I'm hearing from our council is that we want the county to continue with investigating this, but there's also uh, Therese, or Councillor Lang made uh, the request, should we consider sending a letter asking for more public consultation on that? So what do people think about the letter? And let's focus our conversation on that. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Although I agree with uh, Councillor Lang in regards to public consultation at, at this COVID-19 situation, I don't think it's going to happen. So as much as we want it to happen, it, it, and in that I also agree with Councillor Duncan in regards to that there are probably existing contractors doing this. And if um, 
let the government um, contact those contractors directly because I would assume that that's who, how they would like to pass that on is to the, through those existing contractors, sorry, versus doing an all-out public uh, consultation. So um, as much as I would like to do a letter encouraging public consultation, I'll just, maybe the letter could say, we're aware of lack of consultation and that maybe uh, the, the government could try a different way of consulting versus, you know, in, amongst the COVID. And maybe it's through a live stream or maybe it's through a QA and a on, you know, whatever they want to do it. But uh, it's, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm thinking. Councillor Lang. Absolutely, Councillor Swanson, your concerns. I also, um, uh, with this COVID are, are my concerns as well. But I do think they could do an online questionnaire consultation, sending out information or asking for feedback. So a letter then just well, I think we need to be crystal clear in what we expect out of administration, and we will need a motion. I'd like to have a motion for, for both, so admin is authorized to continue investigating, and also a motion for a letter. But we need to provide adequate direction for the letter. So let's have a motion, first of all then, to receive this information and to continue investigation. Could someone make that motion? Deputy Reeves Swanson. We give Tracy a couple seconds to write it up. Any further discussion on that motion? Tracy, can you read the motion back, please? and to continue investigating, I think so. Unless you think it would be better to have two separate motions. Well, let's combine it in one. You could read it back, Tracy. Um, that council accepts the update on the parks, Alberta Parks Restructuring Plans for Information and directs administration to further investigate potential partnerships and present um, information to council. Further discussion on that motion? All in favor? Motion carries. A motion for a letter. Councillor Lang. I'll make that motion that um, Council sends a letter to the Minister of Parks and Recreation um, asking for consideration. Yeah. Oh, I can hardly hear myself. Um, I'll make the motion that uh, this Council sends a letter to the GOA uh, Minister of Parks and Recreation asking that um, proper um, public consultation begun in regards to the, the park or park um, and realizing with the COVID virus this might have to be happen through uh, online streaming but I yeah that's good Councillor Duncan um, just comment uh, Alberta Environment and Parks will be the proper minister for this one, and yeah, yeah. and the uh, I would suggest a letter maybe is would just be a question as to is the province considering public consultation as they move forward with this rather than requesting it at this time. I okay, just to send it back to them. Councillor Lang. 
So um, that's a suggestion as a friendly amen amendment, I take it, and so I will accept that. Okay. So I'm just ask the, or ask the, if the provincial government is going to consider any public consultation as they move forward with this plan. Or with plans to. Optimize Alberta provincial parks. That's how they call it on the website. Is okay. That council sends a letter to the Minister of Environment and Parks asking if the government will consider public consultation on the proposed Alberta proposed changes to the Alberta park park structure. That's good. Everyone good with that? Any further discussion on the motion? All in favor? Motion carries. Any, I think that sums up 7.4. Was there anything else? Matt? Okay. Thank you. Uh, item 8.1. Greater Beat Contract Tender Award, Beat 507. Anytime you're ready, Mr. Magnus. Good morning, Reeve Hoven, Deputy Reeve Swanson, Council. As Council is aware of, Clearwater County utilizes 11 independent greater beat contractors on top of two of our own to maintain approximately 1,872 kilometers of gravel roads. This year, 2020, we have four greater beat contracts which are due to expire, one being March 30th, the other three being April 30th, July 31st, and September 30th. As such, <coughs> excuse me, a tender was most recently put out for Greater Beat 507. The current contractor to Beat 507 is Domad Industries Limited. We, re we received a total of three bids, namely Danielle Kaiser, based out of Breton, RCO Energy Services out of Drayton Valley, and finally, Jomad Industries Limited out of Caroline. The lowest bid received was Jomad Industries Limited at $91 per hour. Hence, it is administration's recommendation to have Jomad Industries Limited accepted as the successful bidder to Greater Beat 507 at $91 an hour. Any questions? Deputy Reeves Swanson. Yes, um, Kurt, being as how that is my area, um, has there been any feedback from the residents in there in regards to the grading from JOMAD up to date? Has there been um, any complaints or, uh, I guess I'm not really looking for complaints, any challenges that uh, some of our residents have had with JOMAD? And if not, um, um, the, how long have they been uh, the greater beat from before? Uh, at this time, I have had no um, indication from our gravel road supervisor in terms of uh, uh, any complaints. I mean, as always, we have little ones here and there dealing with uh, with things such as washboard and so on. But uh, in and of itself, they have done a very good job. And um, uh, they have had the contract for the last five years. So it would be an additional five years with the opportunity to extend it an additional one to a maximum of three years. Further questions? Would someone care to make a motion? Councillor Vandermeer. I'll make a motion to accept.
Okay, so the motion is to accept and award Greater Reef 507 to Geomad Industries. Further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Item 8.2, Leslieville Lands, Conceptual Site Plan and Building Request for Proposal. Infrastructure. Um, I'm going to take the lead on this uh, agenda item. Uh, Christine Haggart, uh, Director of Emergency, and, uh, Emergency Services, as well as Steve DBN, Chief DBN, uh, is here also to assist in answering any questions. So, with that, I will get right into the agenda item. So, at Council's February 11th meeting, Council reviewed in closed session a site concept plan and directed further information sharing and gathering take place at a public open house. At that time, Council in open session directed administration to amend the Lesterville Lands concept site and contour plan to include a phase grading plan, which we'll get into there in a little bit. And to proceed with a tender for Lesterville Lands site grading for phase one. Uh, that tender is in process right now. It has been delayed. Uh, we're hoping to have a draft for that tender uh, early this week. Or mid, mid this week, uh, but we will continue to touch base with our engineers, consultants in that regard as they're feeling some constraints there being able, as they're all working from home as well. Um, the administration worked with the consultants to update the site concept plan, which is amended to include three potential phases. And the version of the Lesterville Lands concept plan was presented to the public at the March 5th meeting and is attached to this agenda. Uh, Council hosted an open house related to the Lesterville Public Services Building and Lesterville Lands Site Conceptual Plan on March 5th, 2020. This meeting started at 6 p.m. at the Lesterville Elks Hall and included a formal presentation on Council's decision-making history and project planning followed by a question and answer session and subsequent tour of the current Lesterville Fire Station Number 10, of course, located in Lesterville. Uh, approximately 80 people attended the open house. The Lesserville Public Services Building PowerPoint is attached to this agenda item and previous public consultation information is available in one place at the Clearwater County website available by the link included in the agenda. It is administration's perspective that the public who attended the March 5th open house were very receptive to the idea of a new fire hall construction in Lesserville and the meeting helped foster understanding of the intention of the uses of the county's 24.43 or uh, acre parcel, the Lesserville Public Services Building. Fire training area and the future community uses in partnership with the Waldorf School Division, as well as the proposed uh, building scope. There were varying opinions on whether the building should be a three bay or a five bay build, but the majority seemed to agree with Council's vision of uh, being future ready and planning to meet the future community needs by constructing a 50 to 80 year building. So an update on the Public Services Building. Um, as it sits today, the designed build RFP for the Lesserville Public Services Building is complete and in draft form, awaiting Council's further direction as to the scope of the project. The RFP in its current state is for a building similar, complementary uh, to the Condor building and includes the options for a three or five bay, uh, three or five bays for Council's cost comparison purpose, purposes after the RFP process. Uh, once the building RFP is released, a three-week advertising period followed by a one to two-week review, interviews, and a compilation of all the results. Uh, the time frame would see the RFP update similar to Condor, um, come to Council during the last Council meeting in April to the first meeting in May. Uh, these dates 
It would likely be a revised given our current situation with the ability for our consultants to uh, adequately uh, resource to, to do this work for us, as well as uh, stakeholder industry being able to respond to an RFP like this. So um, we're doing our best to reach out. Um, there's, let's say this is a very uncertain time for, for the entire world. So um, the dates are definitely subject to change and delay even possibly delay of the construction season of this year. That, that is a reality. So getting to the site design and the grading plan, uh, based on the conceptual site plan, three phases are included. Phase one consists of the building site, parking area, and fire pond being a total of seven and a quarter acres. This is inclusive of all work required for this area, less the future paving in the front of the parking lot. This is estimated at approximately $614,000. Phase two consists of the site grading, internal road construction of water mains, being a total of 12 acres, future concrete surfacing of the fire training area, the fire training tower, and paving of the access road are not included in this estimate of $493,000. Phase three uh, consists of future parks and sports field, a total of 8.18 acres. Pricing for phase three has not been uh, projected this time as the scope hasn't been determined. We can't, we can't price something that we don't have uh, any good evaluation of what our priorities are there yet. So if both faces are constructed together, uh, a total of 19 and a quarter acres, the total cost would be about a million fifty-six thousand dollars The difference being approximately $50,000 savings if they were tendered separately. That would be due to the, uh, the price comparison for the common excavation. The, the higher the volumes for the more volume of common excavation you have, typically the better pricing. Of course, if, you have the, if we split the grading into two phases or three, um, you have the remobilization costs. Really, it, it is subject to tendering, and uh, so these are just speculation based on, on best given information provided. Um, there isn't a huge difference between the price of, of the difference between uh, grade one, phase one grading and phase two grading. It becomes the timeliness of the development after the fact. So it's basically, if it's all graded out, it's ready to go. If you have to put out another tender, you know, there is a delay in that, you know, up to another construction season, for example. So the county's engineers are finalizing the detailed design and tender documents with a phase one and two option. Um, if we, before we put that out to advertisement, if we could actually get council's um, direction as to whether it be phase one or two or both, I said, I don't, I don't see a, a benefit in, in tendering both of them combined for, for a cost comparison, it's so negligible, but really what the, the tender really needs to reflect what council's vision is for the site. And uh, if we can get a decision on that, that'd be great. So I broke it down into three project plans uh, to better identify, you know, I guess the, the size and scope of what we're looking at at this time. So project plan one is what's basically been outlined in the 2020 budget. Tender, uh, tender the grading plan for phase one and two, advertise the RFP for the Westville Public Services building as described, which of course is the complementary similar building to Condor, with a three or five bay option for council to make that consideration for the, uh, I still recommend that, that is something we do include in there to provide that uh, value comparison. And develop a plan for paving, completing phase two and three as additional information becomes available so that's uh, when we're looking at the additional concrete work there in phase two for the training area, um, as well as the, uh, the fire training tower, all these, uh, all this, and as well as start working on an idea for phase three will be better aligned with uh, some of the ideas coming back from Alberta Education or, or Waldo School Division, how they're going to um, uh, deal with some of their access for the school buses. Uh, we've We've actually did get some feedback from there, um, them just in a very high level conceptual idea. They're still looking at very much so doing bus lanes, alternate access, using the proposed access road that was identified in the concept plan. Uh, one of the ideas was, you know, trying to salvage some of the existing infrastructure like the outdoor rink. Uh, perhaps the access road could be relocated to the north side of the school property. So it's all things that are under concept, conceptual plan and consideration right now. But I'm sure with the, given the current situation, uh, how quickly they are getting their design consultants in for 
an RFP for that, as well as uh, getting an RFP or, or a design build tender created for their schools. I'm sure they would have uh, some more information to add on that as well about the timing. Project plan number two. Uh, tender the grading plan with phase one only and advertise the RFP for the Lessable Public Services building as described. So your 5A option, similar to, to project plan one. Uh, develop a plan for paving, grading, and completing phase two and phase three as additional information becomes available. Uh, one, of the, one of the larger concerns have been uh, brought up about the industrial training area and how that, you know, to get some more solid information in that regard, this uh, project plan two basically facilitates that. It's basically postponing the additional grading in that area to until council has more information to be able to make uh, that decision. It's really the difference between project one or project plan one and two is a comfort level of, of council and, uh, and whether they want to move forward with getting the earthworks ready for phase two or not. Uh, project plan number three. So that's basically uh, administration goes back with, with council's uh, direction to say redesign the building to uh, to encapsulate the vision of what of what council would set up for us today for for resizing the building basically we, we, um, we'd be looking for council to provide us that direction to say that, that this is the type of service we want to provide out of this building so make a building that would facilitate that we would go back redesign a building develop new cost estimates and then bring that back to the council for consideration. We could still move forward with the grading plan for phase one. The site grading is not going to change. The footprint is going to be similar. We know the, the, drainage, the drainage patterns and the need for a fire pond and a storm pond will not change. We could still move forward with that given the economic situation that we could actually get that done this summer. Um, so, of course, no, no estimates are provided in that scenario just because depending on what council's vision is for an alternative design building, would really be the driving factor in what the cost of that building would be. So with that, I've uh, just laid out, you know, council seen this a few times, the, what was laid out in the, in the 2020 budget of the $5,120,000, which is project plan number one. Uh, with that, I would uh, take some questions now or let Christine maybe add a couple comments or if I would. Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Christine Haggard. I'm the Director of Emergency and Legislative Services. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add to Eric's presentation. I think he captured our joint uh, item very well. Uh, the only item that I'll touch on is uh, at the open house, we discussed additional mechanisms for feedback. And uh, we had an online form on the website as well. Uh, we had email available on the PowerPoint for people to be able to send uh, information by email. We received an additional one online form. Uh, that person didn't indicate their name, but they had preference for a smaller, uh, smaller building, just a fire hall. Um, and the, the secondary email was a prominent business person who just had some questions around the project, uh, and I believe those were addressed administratively. So, um, other than that, I guess we'll turn it the floor to council unless there's specific questions related to the open house or any of the, the plans. In any questions from Council? Councillor Duncan. Okay. Um, at some point, we at least I need to understand a bit more of the business plan for the fire training part of this. I don't know if there's, could you give us any indication of, that would be phase three, I guess, but um, depending on how we move forward with this, is do we have any numbers yet to date on that? Uh, I guess part of that would be we have what is what do we need in terms of training uh, that we don't already have, or, or what would I, it would basically I guess my question goes to you know I guess what we're just what are, what are we doing outside of the county that would we would do in house now with with a training center? Just for visual treatment, would you mind putting up the site concept plan? So in, we've, uh, 
got the presentation, um, which included the uh, concept plan and contour plan that was at the open house. Can you make it a little bit bigger, Tracy, then, or provide anyone else? So on the phase one is the, the building, the public services building, along with the appropriate sized fire pond. Phase two um, has the, the groundwork and the space for future training centers. So I guess, again, um, echoing what Eric Hansen said, was that this would be up to council's vision in terms of what we want to do. Um, some of the things we already do in different locations, it might be in the yard uh, in Nordic or in the headquarters yard in, in various locations. This would be in an effort to have a more central location for training. Um, for primary use would be for our paid on call firefighters. So, um, and I, I will pass the mic over to answer training specific questions to Chief DBN, but certainly um, some of these things are already taking place in various locations, whether it's at an existing fire hall or um, through training in other areas going off site to different things like uh, the Red Deer Training Center um, and other locations. I'm sure over the years they've gone to places like JIBC or conferences in other uh, places, whether that's in Canada or the US. So again, those are that would be space for those things. Most of that, most of that is either concrete padding or just an area to conduct the training. With the exception of the fire training tower, that would be something that would be similar to uh, what they attend in Red Deer. Uh, various other municipalities have uh, a fire tower like this to train their own members. Um, some have a business model where they use that training center and they open it up to neighboring municipalities and or uh, in this case we've talked about some industry partner potential. Do we have dollars and what that would be for, um, for the county in terms of revenue to offset the operational costs? We don't at this point. Uh, I, it's all going to depend on what the vision is. If, if we think we're going to build this, uh, then we can certainly start crunching those numbers. Uh, if this isn't something that's in council's uh, realm and they think this is outside of what we need to do, that, that's a whole different case. But the one industry partner we did talk with uh, indicated that their potential use would be five to six weeks per year. Um, and that cost comes at around $10,000 a week from what I understand. So it, we're not talking about um, offsetting the capital cost of construction for this. This would be uh, dollars that would offset our operational costs for the building. Uh, but certainly a business case would need to be developed and we haven't got to that point. We're kind of waiting for this conversation to, to move ahead with those conversations uh, with external parties. Um, I didn't talk about the training area in the middle is just a grassy area, so that's just allocating space. And uh, there's some berming area in that phase two as well. That's just for material movement. Um, to get it off the site where we're putting the building and, and flattening the spots for those training areas. So I don't know, um, Councillor Duncan, if that answers your question. It, Is it does. more information um, to come? Should okay. this be the vision to move ahead? Um, and just my other question towards the training would be it would also require some classroom space somewhere as well, right? For Correct. To do yes, the there would be a requirement for classroom space. So if the building size was to change, that would change the um, intent of the training area as well. Not to say that it couldn't still be used for regional fire service uh, training provision. Certainly we can easily shuffle. Um, it's just not ideal to have to shuffle between buildings and locations from right. a practical hands-on to a classroom-based training. Okay. One last question, if I may. Yes. The administrative side of the new building would be how much are a lot of that or parts of that is, is protection, storage of, of equipment, et cetera. We need that, right? There's nothing, we, we just can't go with, with bays without some administrative side to this because they're for equipment storage or decontamination, uh, washrooms, showers, et cetera, right? There's no, that's, it's not an option to be decontaminating at Condor and then bringing equipment over to store at Leslieville, et cetera. Is that correct fair assumption there? Correct. That would, that's a true statement, Councillor Duncan, that there would still be expectation that there would be the decontamination, the separated gear room, uh, ability to have the showers, the saunas, uh, like they do in other stations. Um, in terms of this, the, sh the size of the administrative uh, component, administratively we had that dialogue about how we would accommodate that within the plan. We talked about it at the open house uh, that you know we talked about just going to a one floor building on the admin side and um, keeping the bays either three or five and that cost savings was, correct me if I'm wrong Eric, in the neighborhood of um, three, four hundred thousand dollars. That wasn't going to be 
it wasn't going to significantly reduce the cost of the building, but to outweigh the benefit of having that additional space for meeting rooms, for training, um, for other municipal purposes. Thank you. I, I have a question. I'm a little concerned that some pe residents might think that our firefighters only receive training three nights a year based on the <laughs> earlier presentation. Could the chief just update us on the current training for our firefighters and where they do that training now if they're not at the Red Deer site. And I think after the, the chief responds, we'll be breaking for lunch. And we'll get back to this after lunch. Thank you, Rick Hogan. Uh, presently, our firefighters train every single week. So for example, on the east side, Condor and Leslieville, Caroline, they always train Tuesday night. We look at, uh, we move Nordag to a Wednesday night and Rocky to a Thursday night. So we've got three nights a week that our stations do do training. Many of our members move station to station for training nights. If they miss one night, they'll go to the, another station to catch up that night or to go help out another station. When we start to talk about the burn building and, and the live fire training, that's one of the big cons that we currently have is we only go to Red Deer once, maybe twice a year. And that's usually for our 1001 recruit class that has to go and be recertified or certified to live fire training. What that means is oftentimes our firefighters, when they do their level one, will go to the burn tower once. When they do their level two, they'll go to the burn tower once. From there on out through their career, they may not go back to the burn tower unless they're teaching or helping to instruct at the burn tower. That, that is a huge concern for us. We've talked about it before in, in council chambers about in our homes, we, we're literally sitting on comfortable gasoline now. When you look at how the, the, the makeup and the chemical makeup of all the properties in the homes, these fires are burning hotter and faster than they ever had and also coped with the side of uh, structural collapse quicker than it ever has been. So we've got these two dynamics. Yes, we've got less structure fires due to public education and awareness around that. So it's a low frequency, but it is a high risk for our firefighters. So on the Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday night training, um, there is no live fire exercise currently unless they're in Red Deer, or does that take place in other places throughout the county? Only when we're in Red Deer. Okay. With the exception of our, our burn props that we've got for a car fire and a propane cylinder fire. That's all we do for live fire. Okay, thank you. Uh, time for one more question before lunch. Deputy Reeve Swanson. Uh, yeah, this is just a real high question, and, or high level question, but I'm, and I'm not looking for specifics. But majority of our firefighting volunteers live in the county, close to the stations. I'm, I'm not necessarily, I'm saying, in the hamlet of, or the village of Caroline, in the town of Rocky, in the, you know, in Lusseville, in Condor. They're living in and around those stations is the concentration of where our, the majority of our volunteers are? It depends which station, Councilor Swanson. It, um, for example, Nordegg, we've got a mix of people that live in and around Nordegg area as well as out of the region but travel out there quite often for weekends and or days off. We look at Rocky Mountain House, the majority of our members are in town. When we start to look at the remote Leslieville, Condor, Caroline, we have a lot of members that live in the county in the rural areas. Okay, thank you. We will take a break for lunch. We will try to get back here, or we will get back here at 1240. We'll take a few extra minutes. Thank you very much.
1241 and I will call the meeting back to order. We were discussing agenda item 8.2 Lessieville Lands conceptual site plan and building request. Are there any questions from Council for administration? Councillor Vandermeer. Yes, uh, I believe when we left the discussion, we were having some comments about training. I'd like to uh, follow up on that just a little bit. And uh, first question is, uh, what is the requirement for training? I believe, uh, Chief, you mentioned that um, there are training sessions each week in uh, Condor, Rocky, and Nordic. Councillor Vandermeer, within the training package, um, the Alberta Fire Chiefs Association earlier in 2019 put out a core competency report. So within that core competency report, we went through and we loaded all of our levels of service, our equipment, and it prints out what our required training levels are um, to meet what they call the core competency standards. So uh, a couple of the things that we challenge with within our own service is the runs on live working fires and within a structure. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, oftentimes our members do tower runs, which is when we're running live fire in a structure, for their 1001 testing. Oftentimes, our students may only see one day of tower runs before they even get tested on that core competency. So we try to do it in condensed time frames simply because of the um, power rental and taking manpower and resources out of town. And then when they do their level two, again, they do a tower runs there to keep their, their skill set put into a current status. There are no legal requirements currently other than ensuring that our firefighters are cap able, capable, and competent to do the, the job that we require them to do. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, follow up. Uh uh, question, for the last number of years, this training has been done at these stations and would, as an example, it be done at the Caroline uh, station as well? You, you mentioned that there is training a session uh, once a week where members are called out or they, they are offered the training. Do they have to show up or do you just try to catch as many for an update or for a practice as you can get. How does that work? We have a standard operating guideline which requires our firefighters to attend 40% of all training. Um, and within that, we've developed a passbook. So it's an annual passbook with core competencies or high risk competencies <clears throat> in which our firefighters have to be signed off annually by one of the battalion training officers. So we try to catch them at each training night, uh, which is again, once a week per station but they do move around to different stations if they're away on holidays or sick or, or tied up with work, they'll move around and make sure those competencies are signed off. But uh, specifically for the Caroline station, uh, I, I, I believe they do some, uh, some practice sessions there. Caroline does limited practice on the <clears throat> Caroline station. Um, they'll do uh, hose handling for an example, they'll do apparatus staging, uh, but when we start to look at some of the other uh, portions or exercises to ensure competencies, we move them oftentimes into Rocky Mountain House. Uh, we'll move them oftentimes into the Con or Condor or Lessieville region. Uh, and same for Nordegg. Uh, Nordegg is a challenge in its own with the short manpower that's out there, the commute back and forth. So we're always moving firefighters around to try and catch those competencies to ensure that they stay current. Okay, so... Uh you know, certainly I'm well aware that in Caroline, it has quite a limited uh, surface area outside of the station itself to, uh, to conduct some, some training. So in Rocky Mountain House, are they able to normally conduct their training, the, the routine training exercises at the Rocky Station? Or do they have to go outside of Rocky Mountain House to find sufficient area? Within Rocky Mountain House, uh, the station has been set up to do a lot of the training inside the building. 
um, because that's where we do all of our certified training is in Rocky. It's, it's an ease of use for us. Uh, we are running all the certifi certified training for 2020 out of the Condor station uh, and taking a look at what that looks like. But we have developed a lot of the, the uh, props within the Rocky Mountain House area, i.e. the station. We do ladder work out of the station, um, hose handling, a lot of that stuff we do at headquarters and or by the uh, car wash within Rocky Mountain House. Depends if we're uh, catching hydrants and flowing water that way. Or are we looking at rural water supply where we're using dugouts and sloughs and ponds, rivers to gain that water supply as well. So our training varies depending where we go. And that's why we took a look at the concept plan for the training center. It's such a variety because we try to capture it all into one area that we can set all of our props up there. And it just makes the prop setup and the training night setup that more efficient for our firefighters where we don't have members coming in at four o'clock to set up the props to train at seven o'clock and then tear them down that night and put them all back away. Um, you've got to remember, all of our paid on call firefighters, there's somebody's son, somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's employee. And we are taking time out of their personal lives because they do hold a full time job elsewhere working their 40 hours or 50 hours a week to partake in our training. So we're trying to make it as easy for their personal commitments and for their family commitments as we can. So having a center all set up that they can come maybe a half an hour prior to just prep and away they go for the training night, that, that's a, a huge efficiency for us. Okay, um, now you also just mentioned in, in, in your response there that you're, you've been moving recently some of the training that is normally done in Rocky Mountain House to Condor. Now, Condor is a new site, new facility, and in fact, the area we purchased and is in use at Condor <clears throat> was specifically, as I remember, uh, designed to handle training at that site. Is that so? The original plan was yes, <clears throat> you were correct. However, when we did the stormwater plan, I believe, Eric, do you want to? dive into that one a little bit with the storm water plant because it, it took up a lot of area, surface area as well. Sorry, I missed the question. About the Condor site was originally designed as the train. Yes, uh, hello again, Eric Hansen, Director of Public Works Infrastructure. Um, so, in regards to the eight-acre site, uh, the grading plan and the stormwater management plan that's uh, as, part of, as part of Alberta Environment's requirements um, had to comply. We had positive drainage from the building. We have stormwater management to facilitate the drainage off the building as well as the, the site grounds. So we have approximately two and a half acres in the back um, be able to facilitate additional training. Um, so, that was the intent when the training idea was to the capacity of what we were going to do currently. Um, the vision for training is what really is what drove the design for the new conceptual design for additional training. So this would facilitate all of the auto X extrication um, functions, the boil over, as well as the industry user. That's why as we were site planning for a site for Leslieville, that's why we uh, were looking at larger parcels, a 27 acre parcel, for example, to be able to facilitate all this training in one area. So. Yes, absolutely, Condor has uh, ability to train, uh, to facilitate some of the training, but not to the extent of what the, uh, the, the new vision entails. Just, uh, oh, you got uh, some more on that? Sorry, if you don't mind, uh, Christine Hegert, uh, Director of Emergency and Legislative Services. Thank you, Eric. I just wanted to add on to that uh, discussion about the training at the stations. The training at the stations would be still expected to continue, so certainly, uh, keeping folks in their local community, especially in, in the times of COVID, we've actually mandated that training remains local. Um, but that training grounds wouldn't take away all of the training in the individual stations. It certainly would change the model in terms of how they train station to station. Um, I also wanted to touch on uh, the, the vision and the, uh, the training ground center. We talked about uh, where that vision came from. This is something that started back in 2018 when the regional fire committee of the day talked about how we're gonna use deployment revenues. So deployment revenues are monies that we've gained from 
our firefighters that have traveled to the province of BC and Alberta in 2017, 18, 19. There's approximately about $600,000 in, in revenues that are sitting waiting for uh, a legacy project like this. Uh, and that was the direction the committee of the day said that, that those dollars would be best funded to be used for the firefighters here. Um, we, haven't, we have to work out the details with finance and come up with that <coughs> planning strategy for how that's going to um, offset the cost of capital construction as well um, how the operational cost could be offset with some of those additional partners that could come in. We do know that we've talked with um, other municipalities that use training centers in the central region. Um, some of those training centers have limited access in terms of being able to book them. If you're trying to book in Red Deer, you may be booking out into late fall if you're trying to get a training in there. Um, and so the options to keep the training close for not only our firefighters, but also for our other mutual aid partners that would perhaps use and pay a fee for the, the training center. So that, that information is to come. Unfortunately, we don't have it as of yet because we're, we're kind of waiting for council's vision um, to be confirmed. Uh, just a, a comment on that. It's, it's rather difficult for council to uh, confirm a vision when the, the costs and the revenues and the usage are not really uh, defined. And uh, uh, a specific question about the Condor site, and I understand there may be one or two things you could include there, but I think Mr. Hansen mentioned auto extraction and boil over. Would there be room on that site to do most everything? What would there not be room to do, in fact, on that site? <clears throat> Within the Condor site, um, when we put up a burn structure, in order to gain full um, access to it, we need to have 360 degree access to the building. So that means setting it in the center of a property or a set of a site so we can access it on all 360 sides of it with a fire apparatus. Um, the goal would be to have it set up so we can get the aerial truck around, so we can be able to use the aerial truck and trainer our other uh, stations who don't have access to it all the time, but get them some knowledge on it when they do have to come in or it does come out to them. Um, so when you start looking at a training prop that size, that, that eats up a lot of, of uh, real estate real quick. Um, auto extraction would be another one we could probably put out there. As far as, we could possibly get some of our, our core, core core, but there would be absolutely no room to expand. Okay, thank you for that. Um, one other uh, point, and we touched, touched on it just over lunch, was the fire pond design proposed for the Lesleville site. And uh, the fact that this site is in close proximity to the school division's plans for the school. And uh, it would seem apparent that uh, there should be joint planning for a fire pond, since certainly the school will require a fire pond. And uh, it seems to me that by far the most efficient way to go about this is to discuss and negotiate with the school division and jointly fund and construct a fire pond that would serve both the fire hall and, and the school development that takes place there because uh, clearly there's the, the pond itself would, uh, would be of common purpose maybe somewhat bigger if the school was included, of course. But uh, a lot of the jewelry associated with such a development, the pumps and the piping, the main piping, would be common. So to move ahead, build a fire pond uh, specifically for this fire hall, then have the school division come and build another fire pond across the street or very close, in close proximity would be a waste of uh, overall taxpayer resources. So I think we need to um, make sure that coordination is done before we move ahead with anything. Do you have any response to that? So I guess uh, my response would be, uh, Eric Hansen, um, my response would be that we have had conversations with school division in regards to the fire pond. So just to be clear, the fire pond itself is just a standing 
uh, pool of water. So what it does, it's, it's, it uh, has two uses. One is as part of the stormwater management plan, as well as the, the fire protection for uh, the building itself, the, the, the Lesterville Public Services building. So three uses, actually. And the third one is, of course, a um, additional supply for training on that site. Um, when it comes to uh, the requirements of a fire pond for the school division, uh, that is something that you know our development, as well as in concert with uh, Clearwater Regional Fire, is using an evaluation tour, tool to say we have access to a large amount of water in close proximity to the school. Does that satisfy the need for the the school's use of uh, fire available water? Now, what that doesn't do is it doesn't provide a pressurized water system for for the school, which they may require anyway. So, what uh, likely they would need a cistern for to be able to house close, closer to that, you know, it would be an underground cistern likely, uh, and a pressurized system to ha house a uh, pressurized sprinkler system throughout the school. So um, we have been having those conversations with school division. Um, it'd be more likely that a cistern that would support fire water in the fire hall should be designed for that use, and as well as another cistern will be designed for the school use, than compared to building one trying to reach those, even just the length of distance there to try to maintain and uh, so have a cistern that's sized appropriately for both buildings of that size, as well as um, we don't want to be using, if, if fire use, for example, if we have fire trucks rolling into the fire station, they empty their cistern, and that's also the, the sprinkler water for the school. That's not a good, uh, have a good combination there. You'd always have to be a reserve. So I would really recommend uh, through these previous discussions that, that the school would have their own cistern for their pressurized sprinkler system if it's required as a condition of their construction. And we would have a cistern for our fire water for the, for the pressurized system that's into the fire hall. And the fire pond itself is for training as well as having that external source for, for uh, as a water source for additional fire management for the, not just for our building, but for the community and training. I, I guess that, that, that is exactly the point, that the fire pond particularly, I understand it, the smaller cistern for it right beside, but the fire pond uh, needs to be of a size that would accommodate the requirements of the school. If they, they need something like that. They need, they need a, a source of water in, in the emergent times. So I'm not, I'm not going to speak to what the requirements of the school are. Uh, likely it needs to be have a pressurized sprinkler system. And having a fire pond in the region that's oversized, you know, due to the, the training would possibly meet that requirement. But that's yet to be determined through, you'd have to consider what their actual design would be. Um, I'm not an expert on, on fire code and building code to say what the requirements are for a fire pond for the school. But yes, they would need access to water. And that's a, it's a municipal responsibility as well as a regional fire to determine is that proximity to that fire pond uh, a reasonable, does, does that fill that objective? Well, I, I would suggest and recommend that we need to know that. We need to know what integration uh, is, is uh, uh, would be advantaged to both, uh, both parties because clearly there's no point duplicating. And uh, if, the, if the school needs this source of water, uh, I would expect that they should contribute to it. The uh, Department of Education should contribute to it. Uh, and certainly, if we're going to design it, regardless of who's paying for it, it should be designed to meet the needs of the community, including particularly the school. Councillor Lyon. Okay. So as I've been listening to this, it's um, become quite clear that there's a lot of unknowns regarding this training center um, what's going to be needed, our vision, without some costs, we can't, um, I think, even uh, determine our vision. And I want to draw our attention back to the strategic plan of January 20th, when Deputy Reeve um, Swanson made a motion that recommends Council postpone the Leslieville Public Services Facility, RFP, pending finalization of a concept design and stakeholder engagement and receipt of a report on estimated training revenues for this site. We have not gotten a receipt of any estimated training, training revenues. We have not completed our stakeholder engagement. 
So therefore, there is a lot of unknowns. So for me, in supporting a fire training facility at this time, I can't. And with uh, the delegation from the Taxpayers Association, um, if uh, Mary Ann did her math right, it could take about 100 years to recoup the, the training um, based on what we put out in a year's budget just by having them go to Red Deer. So that doesn't make any sense to me. So I do need to get some revenues and some expenses brought back before I can make a good decision with the training facility. But I have a lot more to say, but before I say it, I am going to put out a motion. So Tracy Lynn, you ready? Okay. So my motion is to direct administration to redesign a fire hall facility for satellite purposes in the hamlet of Leslieville which is to be located on the recently purchased 27.43 acres and that this building along with land purchase and phase one development, including access and paving, not to exceed a total budget of 2.2 million. That's the end of my motion. And that, that budget is basically what we first identified, and we actually have an extra million to work with because we do not have to go under the creek, Lobstick Creek at Leslieville. So that should be enough to give us our original um, satellite service building that this council originally planned, and it would leave us about $3 million in the budget that I think believe we're going to have to severely, like, seriously look at Caroline down the road. So, and with the economic climate... Um, for me, that seems like a wise way way forward. I'm oh, sorry, 2.2 .2 million. Uh, just a question for clarification. Does the 2.2 .2 million include, include the purchase price of the land? Yes. So it's 1.85 yeah. for the building and the land development? I did the math and I think it leaves us about 1.5 or 1.7 for the building. But, uh, but, okay. Can you put the motion up on the screen, Tracy? So, discussion on the motion. Councillor Lawheed. I'm just looking at Actually, my question's changed, but I, w I would like some clarification on our definition of satellite. I know we have a regional fire service, in my view, all our stations are satellite stations to the regional service. So I, I just want to make sure that council is clear on the definition of a satellite. We don't have one small station circling around another larger station. We have a regional fire service in which each station is a satellite to that service. That's how I view it. Councillor Vandermeer. Yes, uh, I, I have uh, some comment on that, and that is that uh, I, I, was, I, I was on the fire committee for seven years, and uh, through, and, and I've been on council for over nine years now, so to my knowledge, over the last nine or ten years, the uh, management and operation of the fire service in the eastern side of the county uh, was that two very small halls historically at Condor and Leslieville were to and are operating as one station. They do not provide the exact uh, pieces of equipment and, and uh, duplicate service. They provide one service to the area 
with different equipment in each little facility there. So what we have now, and I believe, it's my understanding that that attitude will continue, even though in the broader sense, uh, Councillor Lougheed points out that maybe they're all satellite in a way, but they, um, there's only one service on the eastern side, in the same way there's one service at Caroline, there's one service in, in Rocky Mountain House, and one service in Nordegg. And as was pointed out uh, previously, when we decided to, in, you know, the, the, the discussion was whether we would just have one hall, we would replace these two little halls with one. And after a lot of discussion, debate, and input discussion with the community, we said, no, we can, uh, we can actually preserve some quick response service in each of these uh, hamlets, because there are concentrations of assets in each. And we uh, set out to establish the major hall at Condor. That's what happened. It's in, in service at this point in time. And as was pointed out uh, in lead up to the motion, um, the, the intent for Leslieville was to have a, a satellite of the main one being at Condor. So it's my understanding that all training exercises, other than some specific things you might do on your own with that uh, with a smaller complement of equipment in Leslieville, uh, the people of the fire service in the eastern side of the county will train together. They will act as one. Uh, they can do that at the Condor Station in terms of the training exercise. The chief has already mentioned that uh, there's, a, there's a movement of training exercises so that more training exercises are done at Condor. Uh, that is the major facility in the area. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, uh, having some quick response in Leslieville, we as a council, um, uh, have decided that there should be some direct response there. You do not need even all of the equipment that's there now in that hall, so uh, the, uh, the proposed budget seems reasonable from my perspective that you would have a smaller hall and that uh, the training and, uh, and response would be from the area as a whole with the major response coming out of Condor. Councillor Lang. So I just wanted to um, add a little bit more um, as to my thoughts as to why I made this motion. Um, Marianne Cole this morning, she did provide some uh, photos of some fire halls and some other communities that are serving the needs of the community and they're no where the size of Condor. And so uh, last winter, I actually uh, went to Kimberley. And on my way back, I stopped through eight communities. And I actually went to take a look at all their fire halls. So I have pictures on my phone if anyone wants to see them. But some of these communities were like Kimberley, Fernie, um, Turner Valley, Longview, um, Bragg Creek. None of them had a facility anywhere near the size of Condor. So we're very fortunate to have what we do have in Condor. And yes, we do need a facility like that out there, but we do not need a duplicate. And um, when I think of putting something up in Leslieville that's a duplicate similar to Condor, what came to my mind, that's kind of like building a house and putting two fire suppression systems in one room and neglecting some other rooms in the house. Um, because our county's big, and when I think of my area, I got Farrier, West Farrier, Pinewoods Estate, two trailer parks, Ridgeland. The population in that area is probably five to six times what it is in the Condor area. Plus, there's all the, the timber, the spruce, the gas, oil facilities. So there is a disparity of where the fire halls are located in our county. So. Um, in actuality, we don't even need a fire hall in Leicesterville. It is a want, but I will support 
putting one in because I do think it's very nice and we can afford it to have something there in that community. I just think it needs to be as a satellite to back up Condor. Councillor Laird. Um, my question is for Councillor Lang. Um, you indicated that there's a disparity in the county with regard to the farrier acres or farrier area. Have any of those members ever asked to have a station there? Because I've never had anything come uh, to this council in my term and prior to that uh, to administration that I'm aware of. Is there something that we've been missing out on that we didn't know that they were wanting it? Uh, and are they ready, ready and willing to uh, staff that station and take the training and make that commitment? No one from that area has actually asked me for a station. They're just pointing out the duplicate so close. And actually, Marianne Cole pointed that out. Today, she did some studies of how far fire halls are apart in other places in Alberta. So no, no one from that community has asked me for one. Uh, Councillor Lai. Maybe if I could ask Chief DBN on, on that. Uh, probably very familiar with the membership in and around the Rocky Station, and maybe he can give us some idea of you know, the support for those communities for the fire service here at the moment, as far as membership. Thank you, Councilor Lahi. Um, where to start with this? Um, so one of the things we're currently partaking right now is every 10 years we get um, into what we call the Fire Underwriter Survey Report, which directly impacts insurance premiums. Uh, the last one was done in 2010. We just got our paperwork to do one for 2020. So what does that mean? What it means is in order to have good insurance coverage or cheaper insurance coverage, we need to have a fire station within about seven kilometers of our, our major population or dense population in order to maintain that, that high insurance standard rating. Um, so that's one part we're currently partaking. The um, Councillor Lang pointed out about some of the fire halls that she saw on the way back from Kimberley. Ironically enough, we've engaged communications with the City of Fernie who want to look at our Condor Fire Station because they would like to duplicate that building in the City of Fernie. Uh, they built a public works building last year from Eagle Builders, so they're engaging that same type of look they would like to put into the, the City of Fernie. So that was just a, a little bit of extra information with it. We often talk about our firefighters and their need to respond and, and how they feel about this. Uh, I'm gonna share a little passion with Council with this. Across North America and across the world, recruitment and retention of volunteer firefighters is becoming a greater and greater challenge. We don't have a huge issue here yet. Oftentimes we hear of the great training, the camaraderie, the facilities, the apparatus in which our members respond on, which drives people to come through the door. That and their, their compellingness to help the community be part of something that they're much greater than a lone person can ever be. I, I just want to share this little bit of information. Should we ever lose our volunteers in any of our stations and we have to move to a full-time service, we are starting at $150,000 a year per member. You would need a minimum of three to get coverage. You do that math quickly, it's $450,000 a year for three firefighters. That does not include 24 coverage, 24 hour coverage. So you'd have to take that up to six. There's $900,000 to have six full-time firefighters in our service. Um, council may think I'm, I'm crazy with this, but there are the union out there, the IAFF, that the minute we would go full-time would be through the door so quick we wouldn't even be able to see our heads spinning. It would, they would be in that quick. And that's the fair market value they're going with currently. We often talk about the firefighters' feelings and what they mean to us. When we look at it, firefighters don't need us. We need them. We need them to be, to maximize our, our budget, to ensure that we've got the coverage. We need them more than they need us. And also in closing with this, Councilor Lougheed, I appreciate the opportunity. I want to remind Council, back in a Council package in 2018, I shared a comparison. Yellowhead County, Evansburg and Wildwood, 17 kilometers apart. They built a station, or two stations, a year apart. 
Evansburg Station, $6.7 million. Wildwood, $4.3 million. You know, I've got great passion and great pride for our firefighters. They leave work, oftentimes. They'll, they'll come home from an eight-hour day, a 10-hour day at work. They'll leave their family. They'll go and they'll respond to somebody's neighbor, somebody's loved one, to go and help out the community. They'll leave their family behind unselfishly to take on a challenge. Oftentimes, they'll be out all night. They'll work an eight-hour day, fight fire all night, and you know what? Because they're paid on-call employees, they go back to work the next day. If we start to really compare volunteer versus paid full-time firefighters, there is no comparison in my books. I've got friends that I went to fire college with in 2004 that through my career, I know paid on-call firefighters that have been in triple to quadruple the amount of working structure fires than a paid on-call firefighter would be in the city of Edmonton or the city of Calgary. These folks are on for a 12-hour day or 10-hour day, 14-hour night, and then they're off shift. Our paid on calls do not. Councilor Lougheed. Well, well, thank you for that. I can definitely appreciate the passion there for, for serving the community. Would it, would it be fair to say that uh, a firefighter that's chosen to serve his community around Leslieville, if he was responding to Station 10, would it be just as likely that he goes to a motor vehicle accident south of Caroline or a medical incident in uh, Rocky Mountain House or an ATV accident west of Nordig as it would answering the call within that community? Absolutely, Councillor Lahey. They really would. Um, and I just want to touch on one other thing for Council. We look at the two stations, Condor and Leslieville, and we often wonder why we have the two stations and why they respond together. It comes down to manpower requirements. It comes down to the NFPA standard. And what the fire underwriters say is the amount of manpower we have to muster in an X number of time frame. Within that, we've got to take a look back and go, what's out there for employment? We've got farming. We've got limited employment in Leslieville, even more limited employment in Condor. So during the day, Monday to Friday, we know we have a business owner in Leslieville that shuts his business down to respond. He takes away his livelihood to come and respond for us. He's the only one that's great in the community every single day. So when we start talking about manpower resourcing, it's because we're pulling people from different places. We have farmers north of Leslieville that typically would respond to the Condor station, but now they're going to Leslieville to get on a Leslieville truck because it's closer, or vice versa. Councillor Lahey talked about the, the firefighters moving around and responding to different types of calls. I know we've had firefighters from Leslieville out on Ochi's First Nation for a structure fire. I know we've had firefighters from Condor out west of Norday. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lahey, do you still have the floor? Um, I guess my light's still on, sorry about that. So in regards to the motion on John? I yes, I, I, I uh, just wanted to respond quickly to Chief Dibian's uh, passion uh, commentary. Um, yes, certainly um, we uh, and all of council has the deepest appreciation for our paid on call. Uh, actually, uh, uh, they volunteer of their time, basically, and that is different than a full paid firefighter. Uh, I would submit, though, that um, they were doing that when they worked out of a something not much better than a shed. They have worked for years like that because these are people of commitment to the community, and that is not something you can buy with anything. Uh, this is this they're they're serving out of their personal dedication to the community. So it has nothing to do with the size of the fire hall. I don't believe you can, should we say, buy a commitment because you build somebody a better fire hall. We're attracting people who want to serve the needs of the community, and I think that is, is the way it needs to continue to be. 
I do, though, believe that when it comes to providing something, uh, a facility that has the OHS and other safety features, it's important that we provide that. That does not mean that we need a huge area. It means that you need something that will isolate uh, the uh, personal protective equipment from exhausts and other things of the building. You, of course, have to provide adequate shower and cleaning space and those sorts of things. And that's why um, a facility such as that can readily be provided within Leslieville uh, for a smaller budget and, uh, and uh, meet all of those needs and meet the underwriter's uh, requirement for providing a little better insurance rates for uh, Leslieville itself in, in this circumstance. So I'm in favor of all of that. But um, uh, we, we, need to, we need to do what is uh, required in the community, not, uh, not uh, a me too type of approach. Thanks. Okay, we're going to have a two minute break.
126, I'd like to call the meeting back to order. I would like to, uh, we currently have a motion on the floor that council directs administration to redesign a fire hall facility for satellite purposes in the hamlet of Leslieville, which is to be located on the recently purchased 27.43 acres and that the building along with the land purchase and the phase one development, including access and pavement, is not to exceed a total budget of 2.2 million. I would just like to address a few things. I, uh, this council made the decision to, approximately two years ago. We had the decision of whether to go with one fire hall or two fire hall. The previous council had made a land purchase agreement. So when this council was elected, we took over and we consulted our communities. And after much talk and much listening, we decided to go with the two facilities. Then it started another two years of investigation trying to find the right mix between the two communities. And that has led us effectively to today. We have, we have a, in the administration or the agenda package, we have administration saying there are technically three options, project plan number one, project plan number two, and project plan number three. The motion we have up on the board is essentially project plan number three with a fixed dollar amount. I am going to have to vote against this motion currently on the floor. I think to go back to square one, or not square one, let's say square two and redesign the building is a, a step backwards for this council. It's a step backwards for this community. The budget limit of $2.2 million once you subtract the land purchase of 365, once you subtra subtract the land work that has to be done, which I'm just going off of memory, would be about 500, was it four or $500,000, Eric, in Condor? 614. 614, thank you. Of a somewhere down to $1.2 million based on um, just rough eyeballing it, we're looking at about $283 a square foot for the facility, which would give us about a 4,200 square foot facility with the remainder of that money, which barely would give us two bays at that fire hall for that $2.2 million with everything else, not including paving, not including equipment. That low number is just, it's, we would not get anything close to what the community needs for that budget amount of $2.2 million, $2 million. Now I realize we are all very concerned about the money at this time, but to build a, an effective fire hall, it, it costs a lot of money. And if we do not build properly, we're gonna have a facility that in two years, people are saying it's completely out of date, it's not big enough, it's not meeting the needs of the community or the fire service. So for me, uh, I, the question that we should really focus on today is between the three or the five bay option. So I would like to ask anyone else's opinion on the motion. We will have debate on that motion. We will deal with that motion. And then we will, depending on the vote, we will see what comes after that. Deputy Reeves Swanson. Okay. Um. I've said this before and I'm going to reiterate it again, uh, although we call our <laughs> paid on call firefighters, they really are in truthfulness first responders because it is not only fire that they respond to, it is everything that they respond to. So um, I wish we can get change that terminology because it just frames it to one service and they don't, they do multiple services for us. So with that, um, I will say, council, to me right now with this motion, is undermining the level of service that the, that the first responders are going to do. So to me, it's uh, we, depending on the level of service that council wants will determine the price that we're willing to pay. And right now, we're looking, what we're willing to pay is what the service is going to fit into that envelope or fit into that pigeonhole. And I don't want to do that. Um, we've just come through a mediation through a fire service agreement and uh, so for me it is um, we need to support the service levels that we're willing to uh, in, in, in that area and for the rest of our region. 
I do have problems with the CCTA because when I put the calculate the, the percentage, um, they're less than a quarter percent of the population of our county, and we're giving them a big a big voice in that. Kudos to Marianne Cole. She does do her homework and she does bring valid concerns. I'm not saying that she doesn't, but does she represent the the majority of the the county? I don't know. I haven't heard a groundswell at all against this at all. So, in my opinion, uh, we've been given the kudos to go ahead. The other idea, the other uh, issue that I have with Marianne's presentation is when she identifies the halls, fire halls within the package of the distances. I have to look at the whole central region as a whole. Our fire services doesn't just stay in our municipality. They also have mutual aids with other neighboring counties. So there's that help there too. So um, in, all, in all aspects to that. And I have to believe that um, a lot of the assumptions are operational activities and we are also making those assumptions on our operations and we need to get out of the weeds and just determine the level of service and let our fire chief and our determine the operational because they are acting on their best interest and I believe that they are doing what they need to not what they want to. So I am in agreement with um, Reeve Hoven. I am not for this motion because I believe that the level of service that council wants has to match the dollars and I don't believe that this motion matches the level of service that our residents expect. Councillor Laird. Um, first of all thank you and I, I apologize earlier for the queue mix-up um, um, Mr. Reeve and council. So Looking at this, we're talking about, uh, as Councillor Swanson indicated, changing levels of, of support for the current level of service that we have. We're effectively changing uh, and asking staff to fit into a smaller budget, which will force them to change how they do business. Now, certainly we can do that. that that's our option. Councillor Vandermeer indicated that at one time they were happy to work out of literally a shed. And that certainly is the history of volunteer fire services. But that is not who we have anymore. And I will tell you unequivocally, those folks give a lot of themselves. They added on to the stations that we currently have and we know we have to do something because they don't meet the current standards. We are not building a shed or a shop. We are building a fire station for four pieces of equipment and potential growth. While I recognize that we need to concentrate our discussions on a three bay versus five bay, I'm looking forward to seeing those numbers come back. But the current dollars being proposed with all of the expectations that various items are already pulled off of that $2.2 million being proposed in this motion, I cannot support. It is not how we support our very valuable per, uh, people that provide this essential service. Councillor Duncan, you've been quiet so far. Um, thank you, Council Lang, for doing some of the math there and coming up with this uh, motion. I think it gives us something to sink our teeth into and debate. I also agree, I guess, that unless there's savings to be had in terms of the grading, the paving, the and there's no savings to be had in terms of land purchase because that's already done, that we cannot build a suitable building for what remains in a $2.2 .2 million budget. Um, as I've said before in the past, I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to be part of that. One council, or the previous council, that debated this extensively as well, and you know, we did settle on one fire hall. But I've always said that now that we've settled on two, that it's going to be difficult not to get caught spending more money. Um, it, I think it was a good plan 
when we thought we were able to potentially use the existing public works building. Um, we definitely had to change that plan when the real true cost or true capabilities of that site became apparent. You know, our failing was probably not being out in the public with those findings quick enough and, you know, bringing this to the f into the community caused a fair bit of concern here as well. And I do agree with Councillor Swanson that people that are out there that are uh, speaking against this are going to use the facts that help just or help support their position just as anybody that supports it will use the facts that help support it as well. It, I, I'm torn because I, I agree it's, it's overkill to have two buildings, but I think at this point, two buildings of this size, but I think at this point we can't, we're too far down the road. Uh, I, they're, you know, we're going to be placing a bit of a leap of faith here in the bill that they will come in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining good recruitment levels, possibly generating some revenue from training facilities. The, I, one point that caught me in this discussion from, about the training was that it's not just a case of, of substituting what we cost now to go out to Red Deer to train, but we can add a lot of additional training or provide opportunities for training that wouldn't exist if we had to go outside the community. People can get more chances per month to train or get a higher level of certification because the, the facility is close at hand. We can schedule that kind of training, hopefully draw in, say it's a, it's a big hope and we shouldn't base that we're going to generate a lot of revenue from this site unless industry really buys into this. Uh, I guess at this point I would be looking at the, you know, we're going to take heat over this, but I would be looking at the building with two bays. I, I don't think, given this, the codes that we have in place, or not the codes, or the requirements for firefighter safety and that the building we need now is just, can't just be two or three bays. It needs the savings to be had. Once you add on those, the equipment room, the, the con decontamination, there's not going to be enough savings there to warrant trying to really cut back and save nickels here. Uh, I regret it, regret it, but I say we're too far down the road. I'm looking at probably a three-bay facility at this time. Um, we possibly leave the, the upper story, you know, the finishing part of that could be phased, but the building itself with the two stories is probably the best route to go at this time. Councillor Lougheed. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, the budget, the $2.2 .2 million budget, would be very, very tight to provide a safe workplace. Maybe perhaps if you were having a, a fire hall that was no longer open to the public, or having that that option in, in the future, might be able to save a bit of money there. Um, definitely, um, I guess for myself, if, if I could roll a clock back tw 25 years, um, um, I would find it very difficult to believe I'd be sitting in this chair right now arguing for a stronger fire service for the Lesseville community. My, my time was spent in a, in a friendly rivalry with uh, Lesseville being a friendly rival, kind of like Calgary Flames and Edmonton Oilers, and I'd be darned if I'd be rooting for the Calgary Flames. But nonetheless, I think the great equalizer in that has been the regional fire service. I think the depth that that brings to our fire service can't be uh, undervalued. It's, um, it's been a huge uh, benefit to not only the firefighters but the community. I just think this budget of 2.2 million probably won't get us to where we need to go. And it's not gonna, I don't wanna seem punitive to one community either. Um, and this budget would almost seem punitive. So I, I can't support the $2.2 .2 million budget because I don't think it gives administration a fair field to move forward with at this point either. I, I don't know where other fire halls comparably have been built for that either. Councillor Vandemer. Thank you. Um, just a couple of comments on, on uh, The, the size of the building seems to be certainly in question, and, and yes, I, I'm, I'm sure that at $2.2 million, it would certainly um, 
describe a smaller building. And uh, you know that for some, quite some time I have advocated for a two-bay facility. And uh, a two-bay, I believe, could be handled for that amount. Um, and when uh, comments were made, and Councillor Duncan made the comment that we're too far down the road, well, we're not too far down the road, firstly. And uh, to say that uh, uh, it can't work with, a, with, a, with the proper uh, cleanup rooms, storage space, that sort of thing, on a smaller scale without the attendant uh, uh, kitchen and, and uh, meeting space. There's a, there's a lot of meeting space available in the other in the uh, Condor facility. So to say that uh, it can't work, um, I don't buy that because we haven't even investigated it. And that's what this motion is suggesting, is that we investigate. Because I believe that, in fact, you can have all of the necessities of a fire hall for this price. Um, all of the safety features. You won't have all of the extra storage space, but you have lots of extra storage space at Condor. Um, I, I guess I would also look at this in the eyes, through the eyes of the current economic environment that we live in. I am a strong believer that by later this summer, you will be getting bids for things that you never saw before in the last decade or maybe two or three. And that would be another reason to pause for a moment, take a look at this option. Don't dismiss out of hand. When you haven't even gathered, when you haven't gathered actual information or an actual, um, and I'm not saying even a, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say a complete design, but I would say that you could do a, a, a brief design that would describe all of the elements you need in this fire hall and uh, sketch it out. Take another look at that, because uh, in this economic environment, I would not be at all surprised that you could build a lot more than what you're assuming now based upon no information at all. So I think it's worth taking a look at. Thank you. Councillor Lang. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Vandermeer. And that was part of this, my decision for putting the 2.2 in. First of all, it is what we originally talked about. Also, we're in very um, competitive times now as far as getting reasonable bids in. It might be surprising what we could build for this if if something comes back and we can't, well, we don't have to accept it. Also, um, I believe Councillor Vandermeer had uh, mentioned in the past that we do not need four pieces of equipment in at Leslieville. And I've given some thought to that. And knowing that there is more room in Condor, um, we could switch out some equipment for the longer the longer uh, pumper to go to Condor and the shorter one in Leslieville. And, Two bay would probably suffice, but with the competitive market right now, well, we might find that we might be able to get a three bay with these dollars. I think it's worth investigating. Councillor Laird. Oh, I was waiting for the. Okay. Councillor Duncan. The bays, the number of bays themselves, are a small part of the cost here, though. The, it's the other part of the building that's costing the money. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, that's what I don't understand is, is, yeah, we can make them smaller. The, the equipment room could be smaller because there's fewer equipment and fewer firefighters potentially at Lesterville maybe. I don't, I don't know the numbers, so, um, and that may change over time as well. Uh, and people may respond to either fire station too. I, I don't know. Like, it's, there's, you know, we're second guessing a lot of things here. But I, I just don't see significant... Say, like I, 
you know, maybe the RF, if we're going to be surprised what we can get for 2.2 million, maybe we're going to be really surprised what if we ask for something that is currently projected to be $5 million, it, it could be a lot less too. I, I don't think it's going to be significant differences. I don't. By the time we go to tender, it's going to be a month or so or two yet anyway. But I don't see a lot of savings in the near future there. I, I think... It's, I don't think it's going to be there for for the bids like these, especially the the dirt work and stuff. That's right now we're seeing those bids have never been lower than they are over the past few years. The building itself, Eagle Builders, is definitely brought in a competitive bid for the Condor. Um, I don't foresee a huge savings from, you know, we're basing part of our projections on this one on what we paid for the last one. So um, I don't think the change is going to be significant there. Okay, so everyone has had a chance to speak on this motion. I would like to uh, have the vote on the motion right now. So all in favor? Opposed? So uh, two to five, the motion is not carried. So we are back. Project plan number one, which is tending the grading plan for phase one and two, and then the RFP. Project plan number two is tender grading for phase one and then the RFP. Based on the numbers that Min has given us, project plan one is $5.1 million. Project plan two is $4.6 million. So any further discussion on either project plan one or project plan number two? Councillor Duncan. Just a question on the grading. Um, in terms of, I understand that it was a $50,000 savings to only to do the grading of one and two, but are there logistical things with the grading where we would want to do both phase one and two because of potential uh, partnership with a school or fire ponds, et cetera? Because the water does run, I believe, from north to south there. So if you do training at that site, you're going to need to have it graded, I would think, as opposed to you just can't go out in a grass area and do training if, you're, if water is flowing south from there. Is that a fair question? So um, I can maybe speak to that so Eric has some. Um, so the request to split the grading between phase one and two was, was a request by, by council. Um, you're absolutely correct. There isn't really a, uh, a huge cost savings there and, and really would be dependent on the, uh, the it'd be market driven to see if there was be any actual uh, cost savings. But really it, it needs to line up with um, say council's vision. If it's to be, if we know that we're gonna be using this next portion of land for training, I would highly recommend that we do one grading tender. We get all that, that area graded out. Um, you know, even if it's in your one to two year plan, at least that, uh, that earthworks, the drainage would be complete um, and it'd be ready for the next phase. So what other, now that could be, the next phase could be the, um, the construction of the, the training force main that goes around for those training areas. It could be um, maybe the training vision evolves over time, we could get all additional, the concrete work for those other specific type of trainings, um, you know, for future planning. Uh, really, it, it is really just council's vision because we know that, you know, this is just the grading plan which I presented today. There's additional costs that come with those concrete pads and as well as the fire training tower. Those are additional costs to come. And that would, that's not ready today. But this is the grading estimate to future-proof that area so we can make a timely um, uh, move on those that additional training in the future. Um, I say the, the cost savings, I agree with the comment earlier that you're really not going to get much uh, grading cheaper than what we've seen right now. If it is cheaper, it'd be probably down at a loss. And we've seen this historically that if these grading companies continue to work at a loss, they're not going to be around a bit on the next one. Councillor Lougheed. Yeah. I think uh, um, 
Mr. Hansen answered my question almost fully, but, but really the grading plan is uh, a function of the waste, or not wastewater, a stormwater uh, control plan, or are they independent of each other? Well, the grading uh, becomes part of the stormwater, right? If you leave the ground natural, if we only to grade out the first seven acres, per se, uh, the next, whatever the, the balance is, just continues to drain on its own natural drainage pattern. Um, when, as we develop, of course, it all becomes in, in the grading in order to support. That's also the feeder to our fire pond as well, right? So we, we, uh, we know that, that site is um, kind of drains in multiple different directions. What we do is we'd actually focus that all development to provide that fire uh, protection and uh, training water. So it, uh, I guess, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Yep, yeah, thank you, it does. So to help focus our, or to help focus our discussion, I'm gonna go to Councillor Laird in just a second. I think we need to have a motion for either project plan one or project plan two to focus our discussions. We've been debating this for an hour. So Councillor Laird. Oh, I'll wait for the motion then. Who would care to make the motion? Councillor Duncan? I guess for me because you know we don't know I don't know the full details yet on the training center. I, I are enough to make a decision for myself there. I would suggest um, project plan number two would be the motion. Okay. So that is the motion. Discussion on the motion. Councillor Laird. Um, yes, just to uh, talk about um, project plan two and uh, to talk about that drainage. Is there a way that we can go to um, page 19 of 127? Page 19. Of 127, yes. It's a top, uh, topographical Google Earth. I believe. So if you look on that, um, I guess as we get there, the natural drainage off of that site, or is there another spot for site drainage that we can show, is to the southeast into a slough uh, type or low wetland area, and then from there it would be down into the creek. There's two spots, and I just sort of wanted to show them. And I'm wondering if there's a way we can do site grading to accomplish not having any uh, drain off going into a wet lowland area and eventually the creek, especially given that there will be some level of training that happens there, even if it's just in you know, the evenings uh, and whatnot. Um, and we certainly haven't made those decisions yet, but we know at the very least there is going to be some training, there will be some runoff, and we need to control that. Okay. Just as, as, as an additional option, I guess, if, um, if that was a concern for that, if that grassy area was to be used for training, which I agree with Council there, is that uh, we'd want to have containment. Um, the options that are included in the phase two include the development of the, the gravel internal road as well as the fire training force mains. If those were eliminated and this, the site itself was graded out, we could alleviate that concern um, and then defer some of that cost to the future plan. So further comments? on project plan number two, which is the motion in front of this council? I guess, supplementary question. So if I'm reading it, it looks like we would do um, phase one, um, advertise for the building, and uh, look at what do we get back for a three and a five bay option, which we can decide at that time, and then uh, develop a plan for uh, paving grading and completing phase two. What I'm suggesting is we may have to look at completion part of at least looking at the storm drain and uh, how that drainage is contained on the phase two side of things as well as potentially looking at 
where we want to put uh, a potential back alley access um, and maybe eventually school bus lanes. I think that without that, I think we'd be missing an opportunity to at least get that done and managed. Any other discussion on project plan number two? Seeing no for the debate, I am going to ask the question. So the motion is for project plan number two. All in favor? Opposed? Five to two, motion carries. I believe that is it for item eight point, Mr. Hanson. So I know I just the comments and conversation that that, uh, that was just had in that regard. I don't. I just didn't want to get that lost in because the interpretation of project plan two doesn't include Camry's comments in regards to that additional grading. So okay. I wanted, if that's the intent, then I'm fine. But I just well, want to make sure that intent's there. From my perspective, we voted on project plan number two, which at this point is only. A plan for phase two and phase three, so it would not include Cami's comments. That's correct. Unless it wants to be revised to to support those comments. If you, that's that's the only thing I would change if you're actually going to motion out that. If if it's just in support of what we discussed, then, then it's clear for me. Okay. So administration is looking for further clarification, so there is no confusion as we move forward. The motion that was passed does not necessarily include the additional comments that Councillor Laird brought up. Do we wish to have a motion to include that, not the complete dirt work, but the partial dirt work for drainage? Councillor Laird. I would make the motion to include Oh, sorry, I'll start again now that it's recording. I would make the motion to include the part of phase two site grading for um, stormwater and drainage management. I'd also, I'm going to push the envelope here, need to think about that back alley access road as part of that. So can we get a little clarification on we need to think about the, the back road? We need to be exact here for administration. Mr. Hansen, you have a comment. So I'd absolutely recommend if we're going to grade out phase two, that that's that's how the earthworks work best. If we're going to do, if we're going to grade out phase two and, and not include the internal access road and the force main, is that we actually grade it out. We we basically store the topsoil piles as presented in the concept plan and construct the access road at the same time just to a gravel standard so that all that earthworks are done in a single uh, congruent timing. Just because if you don't build the, the access road at the same time, you're having to borrow from phase three actually to construct your road. So um, basically it would be construct all of phase two, less the access road construction, as well as the first main uh, fire water system. It's more of a revision of project one. Okay. So I believe Councillor Laird did make a motion that is out. Could we have that read back? Oh, it's on the board. Excellent. Thank you. Grade out access routes, the storm drainage. I'm confused. That's pretty close. <laughs> if that's the intent, then the motion works. But it needs to be clear. It does need to be clear. So. We'll let Tracy get. Is that designing? Is that clear enough for Public Works? So, grading of phase one and two. Excluding the construction of the internal access road and floor space. Excellent. Excellent.
this little the internal access room and force me. And it, because I thought including construction of internal access road up there. That's the, the access okay. road along the adjacent side of the. So, and excluding. It's the, the so it's the, it is the, it's so it's, huh. it's one and two, including the access road, but excluding the internal access road and the first one. And, and the one. So. I, I didn't hear that last time. First thing. So the internal pressurized first thing. And we need to remove the first internal from the, because we have including construction of internal access road and excluding the internal access road. So we just need to be clear. That is a few more details than what you said. Are you I, th I believe the motion? intent is there. I'm just rereading it. Questions about the motion on the table? Do we want to say including? Okay, let me read it. The council amends the project plan number two to include grading of phase one and phase two, including construction of access road. Do we need to say and drainage, excluding internal access road and force main? I think we need to say uh, that it's the drainage is included just for absolute clarity all right I'm going to read it one more time that council amends the project plan two to include grading of phase one and phase two including construction of access road and drainage excluding internal access road and force main. That reads the intent of what I was looking for. Thank you. Further discussion or questions on the motion? I will ask the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Is that clear for administration? Okay, we'll be taking a 10 minute break. We'll meeting back here at 2.15.
Uh, I'm calling the meeting back to order at 2.19 p.m. And we have item 9.1, the draft strategic communications plan. Good afternoon, Council. The agenda item before you, can you hear me well? Okay. The agenda item before you comes following the direction of Council in late 2019, where administration was directed to draft a strategic communications plan for review at the January 20th Strategic Planning Council Committee meeting of the whole. The committee reviewed and requested amendments for clarification to the document, which serves as an overarching strategy to help guide administration in ensuring Council's communication priorities are known and used to drive activities. At this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to define what a strategic communication, communications plan is. A communications plan is simply a guiding document acting like a governing policy that outlines communications goals, provides some situational analysis, and proposes approaches and activities to achieve the identified goals. A communication plan sets out the time frame for carrying out these objectives, details the resources and support that will be necessary to achieve the goals and identifies how results will be measured. This particular strategic communications plan was developed to complement the Direction of Council's 2019 to 2021 strategic plan and is a hybrid of both organizational and communication planning processes. A cautionary note here to, to mention is while communications planning um, is a written document, um, they need to be thought of as a living document. The, since the communication landscape is always changing and new opportunities will continually arise um, for developing organizations' messages, sorry, my part, pardon me. The communication landscape is always changing and new opportunities will continually arise for delivering our organization's message to both internal and external audiences. For this reason, com written communications plans should be reviewed regularly, at least annually, and they should be constantly referenced. Going forward, the methods of communication will be limited to this document until further review to ensure that adequate resource capacity is available to, in, to integrate new, sorry, prior to integrating new communication tools. At this time, administration would like to ask if council has any questions or amendments to the plan. Any questions? Points of clarification on the plan. Councillor Laird. Um, thank you. Uh, they don't happen just magically. So thank you for your efforts on putting this together. Uh, first of all, I guess I'm looking at the branding on page uh, 122 of 127, uh, or page nine of your document um, and I agree like you look at branding it we're more than just uh, the logo uh, so much more than this the logo and and I can tell you unequivocally um, when I look at the efforts of staff over the years and council over the years and their decision making the value that's put in the decision making and the efforts to make those decisions into realities we're more than a logo, for sure. And when we talk about branding, um, what does that mean to you? And it's gonna mean different things for the council, the CAO, the staff, rate pairs, stakeholders, and visionaries and, and visitors to our area. And if I were to put it in two words, and I would challenge my fellow councillors what this brand really means to you. And for me, I can put it in two words. It means quality and caring, and I can assure you, I can assure you, if we never proved it before, we certainly have in the last number of weeks as we work through COVID. And I have watched staff members step up that I didn't know that they, because they're out doing other things, and they are doing job sharing and uh, an amazing, uh, you know, job of of making sure that they meet the requirements. And that really speaks to this branding. And I guess um, it's just our moment to say it's more than a logo, and I'm so glad you put that in here. But I'm back to, I'm gonna challenge my fellow counselors in two words. What does that mean to you? Mm -hmm. 
Is that a homework assignment, or do you want an answer right now? Right now, you should know it. <laughs> what was the second word that you used again? I used, sorry, I used quality and care. Would anyone care to add their two words? Deputy Reeve Swanson. And I'm on community and connection. say community and the next good thing. So what was that? Community? Community and the next good thing. Councillor Lang? I kind of like uh, Deputy Reeve Swanson's community and connection. I'm going to go with that. I have something else I want to say unless you want to ask more about these branding questions. Well, let's finish. Let's okay. get everyone's insight. Councillor Vandermeer or Duncan, would you care to share? I don't think I have another word. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Lang? Yeah, I think I'm going to go with the Councillor Vandermeer. Well, yeah, it's hard to, hard to beat in two words what uh, Councillor Swanson came up with because in, even in our vision we have community, prosperity, natural beauty, connected. So community and connection is right there in our, in our vision. So those are a couple of good words I, I can't. I can't come up with any better right now. You know, the two words that are coming to my mind are gentle strength. Because our, our, uh, we, we live in a beautiful place. I'm, I'm kind of getting the image of a, just a, a, a sleeping giant who's there to help. And when you need help, he stands up and helps. And I think that's especially uh, during the troubled times that we are in now and could be in the next few weeks or months, I think that quiet strength is going to be very important to all of us and to all of our residents. Thank you for being Councillor Lang. Okay. So just um, one thing with this, um, sort of my thoughts as I read through this. So once again on page 122, 127, um, under understanding, uh, there's this sentence. A second component of the analysis phase would be developing and implementing a broader citizen engagement program or strategy to allow citizens additional input into policy decisions, services, and issues, priorities, which is a great statement. Yet, on page 118 of 127, when we have our little uh, circle chart here, um, at the bottom right where it says citizen engagement, there's no, um, it's one way. It's us telling the citizens there's nothing for their input to come back to council. So the sentence on page 122 does not fit the arrows on this page. I think it should be a back and forth. If we truly want citizen engagement and if we truly want their input, there should be an arrow coming from citizen engagement back into the communications plan and tactics so it ultimately feeds back into our vision and mission and everything else. Thank you. Deputy Reeve Swanson. So again, under the understanding and in regards to the, the chart there with primary tools, um, I, I just don't see where we're, we got there. Um, videos. I, I would like us to do a little more video engagement. So I don't know if that's as a more as a primary tool, in my opinion, but that could, if that's a specific under if those are meant to be general and then specific. Uh, you know, Just as, as a response to Councillor Swanson. Uh, yep. Videos are not currently listed as a primary tool because it's listed as an opportunity under under the SWOT analysis. Okay. Our current capacities do not allow us to readily utilize vid videos. Very good. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry, DJ. Could you repeat that? I don't know if I understood you completely. So, Councillor Swan Councillor Swanson's uh, question was um, if videos should be added to the primary tools uh, table. Yes. Um, the reason they're not listed there is because I've noted that under the opportunity section on the SWOT analysis. 
Yes? Okay. Thank you. Deputy Reese Swanson, was there anything else you'd yes. like to respond? Um, and, and I might have missed this, and I guess this is a question. I know we've talked about the opportunity of having an open council, and this kind of leads to Teresa's, our uh, Councilor Lang's uh, public engagement. And, and I know we've talked about it on more than one occasion through our staff planning, and, and I don't believe we talked about an open council, but, um, and I'm not sure if it's going to be coming up again, but given this environment, I've done a lot of thinking here as far as, you know, maybe going that route again, and maybe there's an opportunity to kind of, before we open our, go into our, our council meeting, maybe there's an opportunity to say, Let's, let's allow our public to send in a question or two. And the first five or 10 minutes of our meeting is, okay, we got a, we got a question from this and, it's, and it's, it's an open question that we can either answer or have our administration answer before our meeting. And maybe it's for the first five or 10 minutes or something like that, but at least it allows the public to start sending us in some questions that we have to answer and if it's done before our council meeting because i believe brazo does it but they do it in an open forum but being as how like i say with this covid uh, situation it might allow our public to send in a question that um, whether administration like council reads it out and administration answer or it's something that council can answer so i'd like us i don't know if it's listed in here DJ, but it just would be uh, something that I would like to see, you know, as far as that public engagement is it's a small piece. So if you have any comment to that. Um, administration can certainly look into how that would look. Councillor Lang. Uh, <clears throat> Deputy Swanson, I love that idea. Um, it's been brought up before, only more like to do like Brazo County, but that it's difficult that way because it doesn't give us or administration a chance to sort of research to give the proper answer, but perhaps we could um, do as you suggest, as long as those questions are submitted and put in the agenda package and meet the cutoff deadline just like any other application, then that gives administration and us some time to do some research uh, so that the question could be properly answered. And um, I have a, another thought for this um, communications. Um, I've kind of been brewing on it for a couple weeks here. We have four strategic planning sessions a year. And sometimes throughout council, just like with the fire halls, um, there comes a need for public open houses and meetings, and it gets sprung on us or it gets identified, and we don't often have a lot of time to arrange for these meetings before we can move on. So I'm just thinking for transparency and so that we can get the feedback from our constituents before we go into these strategic planning sessions, maybe we could just book a haul a week or two weeks, like I'm thinking Dover Court, and so four times a year, we have a meeting at a certain hall. This is what's on the agenda. This is what we're going to be discussing at a strategic planning. It's advertised. Um, they know well ahead of time. And if they have any concerns or questions, they can just come. And it's so we're, we're, we get all the information before we're trying to make these important decisions rather than scrambling like we, what we did. And I know with the COVID virus, it, that's not, we could not do that now, but maybe in the future we could do that. And I, I, I really think the public would appreciate that. Anyways, just a thought I've had, and maybe we can do some more investigation into that. Councillor Laird. Um, absolutely support both uh, Councillor Swanson's uh, suggestion of a question period for five or ten minutes at the beginning. It's been something that's been... Uh, going through my head and how that could be accomplished and um, as Councillor Lang indicated and in including it in as those questions if they come in as part of the uh, timeline for the um, for the agenda package uh, I think that this would be value added especially in the current situation where we truly are going to be struggling to try to have in-person meetings for some time 
Um, the strat planning sessions and having a hall, you know, one or two weeks ahead of time to talk about those key things, I, I think that would be value added as well and I'd support that. Uh, the other suggestion I'd like to see us uh, do is after each of our council uh, meetings, just uh, one or two minute, and I know videos are hard to fit in, uh, with the Reeve, uh, a video that just highlights, these are the highlights of the meeting that could be done and put online. Um, I think that would be value added as well, and I recognize that's extra a burden on our Reeve and on staff. I just think that it would add a lot to encouraging, I'll say viewership, as well as uh, participation in our governance. I have a few comments. How many people currently subscribe to the e-newsletter that you mentioned on page uh, 125 or 127 in the e-news? And is that a tool we currently use or we're looking to expand on that? When administration launched uh, the new website in 2018, I believe, um, we had um, a feature on, at the bottom of the website where if you wanted to stay up to date with county news, you would subscribe yes. and become a subscriber. So it's basically a canned template of an email uh, that you can add specific information, whether it's recent notices, news releases to it, and you can mass email out to your subscribers. In the two years since we've had our new website, um, as of the beginning of March, we've had over 400 subscribers. Uh, the most recent use for that was uh, last week during the COVID-19 um, ECC activation. Um, we use that as a, as a main uh, communication tool to let all of our subscribers know what uh, Clearwater County is doing and how they can access resources through um, AHNS's website. Okay. The reason I ask is you know, now social media having to go through an algorithm Quite often, you know, when Facebook first started, you could put a post and you can be just about guaranteed that 90% of the people who followed you on Facebook would see that. Well, now, with uh, views maybe 10% of the people who like Facebook and Twitter are no longer a real accurate way or a fast way to get information out to people, but email, everyone still has an email address. And I was just wondering if there's a plan to develop that more as a way to get information out to people quickly and urgently. Not on a, you know, every two weeks we send an email just because we have to, but here is some specific, specific information to help you today and get that out into people's hands. My other question was about the app. Are there any plans? Well, in the news, new communication tool category at the end, I do not see the app mentioned at all. Whereas I think the app, if we could get if we can utilize that better and get it on just about everyone's phone in the county, um, it might be a tremendous asset to keep our communication up with people. Um, oh, and back to the e-newsletter. Is there any way we could possibly segment the, the people who subscribe to that based on their area? I know some email service provider companies you can have a tag for each person because it might make sense to have, a, let's say, a, a West category for people in Ferry or Nordeg. And then if there's an open house in Nordeg, you could only send the email to people with that tag only to that area because the people in James River don't need to know that there's an open house going on in Nordeg and vice versa as well. So is, is that something that could be investigated? We can investigate that. Currently, the only, only categories of subscribers is if they choose to receive a news release piece of information or a recent newsletter or any other type of information. We haven't categorized it based on location, just based on subject or contents um, by the county. Okay. Yes, Councillor Lane. Uh, Reeve Hoven, I, I like your idea with the apps. I, I don't really agree with the idea of having separate areas like you use Nordic and James River. And the reason being is because we're all taxpayers for all areas of the county. Okay. And there may be reasons that someone may want to go to another area. So it's just my initial thought there. Okay. Councillor Lyde. Yeah, I think it's great we put some focus on, on modern media and, and those extra technologies to reach, uh, reach, our, reach our residents. However, I don't think we should overlook that a number of our residents still use the basic phone line if they need information. And I, it was brought to my attention recently by 
one of the rate payers in my area that uh, they are on the um, Eckville phone exchange and it's still long distance to to reach the county. So that might be some thought put into there if we can get some sort of a, I don't know, a toll-free or some sort of a, a different number so that those people that are within that uh, telephone exchange can still have full access to all the, all the full services of the county through the phone. Thank you. So the staff recommendation is one, that council approves the draft strategic communications plan. And two, that council directs administration to provide a communications update to council on an annual basis. Now with the discussion we've had, do we wish to see that added to anything added or further expanded? I don't know if it's necessary before we approve the draft communications plan. Any comment on that, DJ? Um, if council wishes, you may approve as amended. Okay, approve as amended. So expand the e-newsletter. Uh, add something about the apps. Uh, Councillor Lang's comment about citizen engagement having bigger and multi-directional arrows. Because it should be the that should be the number one focus. That's why we're communicating. And also, Dick Brief Swanson's um, suggestion with uh, sending in the questions ahead of time. Okay. And a Q and A. Just one question for council: um, Is there any thoughts or suggestions regarding the podcasting opportunity? Deputy Reeves Swanson. Yes, please, please. I, I think there's, I don't know where it would go, but absolutely, I think we need to look at podcasts. Um, yes, you do have a, um, under the e-news, uh, I think that should be come in as soon as possible. And now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is part of the scope or not, but your our communications department is only one person. <laughs> and... I firmly believe that um, if you can find some help, even if it's seasonal help, I, w I would endorse that because I know how much um, social media and all this communication takes some time. So um, if, yes, podcasting, I would love to see this happen in the near future, like this year, this before summer, before even spring, uh, some ideas and uh, going forward. And if... Again, if the help is needed, I'm, I'm, I would endorse that. So, Councillor Laird, and I guess just backing up beyond that, uh, one of the things that is always interesting and and uh, dynamic for sure is uh, the media monitoring, uh, and I know that that can be very t uh, time consuming, uh, especially with social media and trying to get out, um, I'll say, as close to real-time answers that are uh, from one location uh, and are with our message to provide facts um, rather than leaving uh, various uh, assumptions on hot topics in the community. I think that that's going to become a greater role. And again, this is where we're going to need, I believe, additional staffing. I'm not suggesting that we're monitoring it 24-7. I think that is way too much to expect of anybody. Um, but having some method of uh, monitoring it, figuring out what the trends are, and providing um, as timely as possible with the working day. Um, so if something happens on the weekend, we give an answer of fact on the Monday morning. Um, I think that, you know, after it's been reviewed, I think that that's going to become important. Um, uh, and it already is in our community. We're seeing that. So I, I guess I'd like to see that included as well. Okay, thank you. So any further questions from administration on that, uh, on investigating staffing increases to help our communications department? Thank you. Any further discussion before we have a motion? OK, 
Okay, would someone care to make a motion? Councillor Laird. Direct strate uh, that council approves the draft strategic communications plan 2020 to 2022 as amended. Further discussion on that motion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, this, the second motion that council directs administration to provide a communications update to council on an annual basis. Would someone care to move that motion? Councillor Vandermeer, further discussion on that motion? All in favour? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Council. So that concludes item 9.1, the reports, the CAO report. Good afternoon, Council. The CAO report for March 24th, 2020. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, all upcoming events for March and April have been canceled. The attached Government of Alberta publication, Municipal Governance During the COVID-19 Outbreak, answers frequently asked questions about maintaining municipal governance in accordance with legislation during this pandemic. Municipal Affairs intends to explore options for necessary flexibilities, modifications, and extensions while ensuring ongoing operations are complying with the Chief Medical Officer of Health's recommendations. Clearwater County COVID-19 update. Clearwater County has activated its ECC, which is the Emergency Coordination Center, as of March 17th, 1 p.m. or 1300 hours. All non-essential meetings, gatherings, and travel have been restricted as per the Chief Medical Officer of Health's recommendations. Clearwater County buildings are closed to the public access until further notice. County services may continue by appointment only. As a precaution of COVID-19, a sanitation schedule has been created and includes cleaning in all buildings on a two-hour rotational basis during business hours. The ECC has developed a centralized employee resource list to track the availability daily, i.e. working from home, isolating, availability, planned working from home rotations, and will access daily or as needed in order to continue to provide the critical municipal services in a prioritized manner. Any questions for uh, Mr. Emmons. Okay. If I may, Reeve Hoban and Council, just uh, I wouldn't mind taking the opportunity, as Council's pointed out earlier, truly wouldn't mind putting out a public appreciation for our staff. Uh, they've stepped well beyond their departmental borders, uh, well be beyond their job descriptions. We have construction supervisors that have picked up cloths and sanitation uh, equipment and cleaning doorknobs so that the people in this building maintain a safe environment. Um, we have public work staff that have taken over the position of facilities um, as other people are in isolation. Um, the level of cooperation, um, going back to a previous conference, uh, conversation of council, um, I guess I would like to add one of my two words would be family. So thank you all. If there's no questions with the CAO report, I will proceed to the public works. Um, so if any staff are feeling ill, they've been asked to stay at home for the full 14 days, just like the chief medical officer. How many staff are not currently at work due to self-isolation. So for clarification, the uh, 
the, the feeling ill and feeling ill in isolation are two different conversations. Um, so truly we have two different tracking lists. Uh, one is some staff would be out anyway, just because of uh, it's that time of year, snow melt, you know, uh, going from minus 16 to plus 10 in 24 hours, they, they're sniffly and they got colds, um, which is not a COVID symptom. Uh, so it doesn't, they don't fall without COVID symptoms. They don't fall into the 14 day isolation. They're just sick. Shouldn't put it that way. Um, they're not feeling well. Um, the ones that actually have COVID symptoms, to be clear, are not diagnosed, not proven, but carry COVID symptoms, fall into the 14 day isolation. I believe last count was four. Uh, but with sick included, as far as polls, I believe we're at eight. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions for Mr. Emmons before the Public Works report? Okay, Public Works. Are there any questions about the Public Works report or do we wish, perhaps you could just give a summary of all the projects that are currently on hold? Um, I'll let the polls, if you want. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not mine, but. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Eric Hansen, Director of Public Works Infrastructure. Uh, so, um, I'm going to go down. So basically, as you're well aware, um, Kurt will be speaking to his uh, operations portion and I'll speak to the infrastructure portion. I just gotta scroll down there. So as, uh, as Rick pointed out, most of our gravel road rehabilitation staff have now been reallocated to the, either the sanitization crew or is currently in isolation. And uh, I'd like to thank them for stepping up and taking on those new roles, as well as our facilities uh, supervisor and, and additional facility maintenance. Sorry. Really touchy. So our base pave uh, planning Tender development landowner agreements are underway for the Spate Road uh, grading project. Um, some of these isolation um, requirements are making it difficult to connect with landowners, um, as well as the tender advertisement. We're continuing to always evaluate when is an appropriate time to to tender um, in a situation that's uh, continuing to evolve, such as this. Um, so we are working on the uh, on the grading tender as we speak. I said, we'd still need to finalize some of those landowner agreements in that regard, which has proven to be a little bit more difficult than, than ever. Uh, asphalt overlay, uh, the, the crushing has, uh, is scheduled to begin at the end of March there for the Brewster pit. Uh, it's adjacent to the Sunchild Road, so that's the pit that's been, that has been provided by the county for the for border paving to use to provide uh, the material for the asphalt overlay up there. Uh, we're still waiting to confirm whether they can actually move on that construction, so that may be delayed. Um, Nordic Historic Corps, uh, the work that they've done previously with some of the, the brush clearing, that has been completed. Um, it's not delayed as of yet because uh, they're waiting for summer conditions to move on that project, so that's, that project is currently on time. Uh, Heritage Center renovations, uh, it's just some... There was just a few things that were left to be done with the renovation that is currently on hold. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, those renovations wrapped up before the, the opening of the Heritage Center. Uh, same with, um, I'm not sure if it was on there actually, is the, the staff house there that we've, uh, we've uh, moved forward on, on getting a staff house modular um, um, facility is being constructed in Ontario and that, that was supposed to be done in place by uh, April, 30th we're hoping that uh, the construction is still on schedule we haven't heard that it's that it's been delayed as of yet uh, we'll see how that goes as with the interprovincial travel etc that may come down the, the line here later in the month uh, big orange store uh, there again I think we, we, just, we discussed this not that long ago that that work has been postponed for the for the uh, demolition and uh, the removal of that of that building and the salvage of the the bricks in that building a portion of the old staff houses there again 
Um, so additional hazard testing uh, proven to be some mitigation work there. So that that uh, that work has been postponed for now. Uh, the administration building renovations downstairs currently ongoing uh, with some additional office space, file storage, meeting room. Uh, contractors have been asked to, to leave the building, so that project is on hold. Um, land acquisition, we've recently received the letter from the Village of Caroline uh, endorsing the sale, so that's great news for that. Uh, I've discussed with our engineers today, we're still on track for the environmental assessment to be completed. So it sounds like we should be able to meet the, the condition dates in a timely fashion. So possession is scheduled for May 15th, so that project's on time. Less about public services, we've had lengthy discussion in that regard, so I'll, I'll uh, leave that for now. Uh, the broadband RFP, um, we've been fielding some questions from proponents there. We've been putting it back on, on the APC, the Alberta Purchasing Connection website, in response to some of the questions, but that... Uh, that RFP has been extended by two weeks with uh, certainly an option to extend it again if, if need be, if the proponents are requested or we feel that it's necessary to extend it for an additional period of time. Sorry, sir. What's APC? Alberta Purchasing Connection. That's the uh, provincial, or it's the interprovincial website there for tenders and RFPs. It meets our requirements for the New West Partnership Trade Agreement for Advertising. Any questions for Mr. Hansen? Mr. Magnus, do you have anything you wish to add? So my last comment is that we did pull the trigger on road bans are going on noon there on Friday, March 27th. I believe the province is putting theirs on Thursday and Lacombe County, I got confirmation from them that uh, they're putting theirs on the Friday as well. Okay. And that will all be shared on the website, I imagine? Yes. I'll just follow uh, what Eric did here in regards to just doing a quick overview of the projects that we have uh, uh, online for uh, 2020 as um, approved by uh, council at the uh, 2020 budget. So our uh, bridges, we have five bridge structures that we're going to uh, move forward with uh, putting in place this year. One is a carryover. The other four are just currently being completed in regards to engineering and then putting a tender out. At this time, we have no indication otherwise from um, the, any contractors out there or from our engineering firms that there might be delays. Uh, we need to keep in mind most of these bridge rehabilitation projects, replacements occur in the summer, uh, particularly due to uh, environmental regulatory approvals. And that's because of that, that delays any of these rehabilitation replacements uh, until usually uh, mid-summer, uh, August, sometime early September. So we'll, we'll see uh, in terms of where this COVID-19 goes, if that is, uh, could have a potential impact on these projects at that time. But for now, they're still a go. The uh, Nordic water well number eight, uh, that well has been drilled. They're currently in the process of testing the water, flow testing. So there's no indication from the contractor or engineering firm at this time that there'll be a delay in regards to completing that project. There might be a delay in terms of installation and tying that well in. And again, that will be strictly due to uh, environmental regulatory approvals at the, on, on that part. The uh, Nordic Bulk Water Monitoring Station that is currently being fabricated with the intent of installing it in summer. And again, uh, that's yet to be determined if, if uh, uh, in terms of we can still meet that if there are changes in terms of COVID-19, but nothing has been indicated otherwise that we can't still achieve that. The, uh, the uh, Nordic Lagoon Aeration Blower has been ordered and our uh, intent is still to install that and that's probably going to occur sometime in September. The Condor Lagoon upgrades, Pradernes has that contract and uh, they're antsy and they want to get going so there's no indication on their part that, uh, that these current circumstances that we're all faced with has slowed them down. They're wanting to get going so uh, as uh, April is their uh, uh, 
and chant, and we haven't heard anything otherwise um, in regards to that as well. So their intent is to complete that project. The uh, Condor Replacement 41 collection mains, uh, the, we received uh, the tender to that was closed here just recently, as indicated in the public works report, and we received ten, seven tenders, and we're currently reviewing those. So um, as of right now, again, uh, unless whoever that winning bid is and that contractor tells us otherwise, um, it's, it's their information that they passed on as if they have certain protocols in place where it would may delay them uh, pursuing that project. So that's yet to be determined. The uh, regional wastewater system, uh, that right now just involves strictly engineering, so there's no delay there. And our intent is to bring that before council the, uh, in the uh, S September strat Strategic Planning Committee meeting, where we'll present to council some options for, that, for you to consider moving forward uh, if that is a path that council so chooses to pursue in regards to a, a regional wastewater system at the Lesterville site. The uh, Hamlet streetlights, i.e. particularly a Nordig, that is still on track and in the near future here we'll be putting out the tender for putting up the three additional uh, um, streetlights at the corner intersection of the access into Nordig and the highway, Highway 11 itself, and energizing all the uh, remaining uh, 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 streetlights. Uh, so that's going out to tender as well no intent of, of delaying that project. And finally is the cell 2 development. The tender closes this uh, tomorrow in regards to uh, the uh, hiring of an engineering firm to oversee that. And again, there is, uh, there's a timeline, a bit of a uh, prudent timeline that we need to meet there in regards to the cell 2 development in terms of uh, utilizing that grant. So again, at this time, nothing has been indicated to us to uh, delay that. Any questions about the public works report? Councillor Lang. Just one question. Kurt, like Nordic water well number eight, does that mean there's eight water wells out there now? No, that was just a designation we gave to it. Um, we don't currently have eight up and running. Um, historically speaking, we had, uh, I believe, uh, wells one to six at the time, or one to five, something to that effect. They are no longer functional. They don't provide the necessary um, uh, water that we need. So when we put in the next well, which was well number seven, so we're just following the numbering in terms of uh, where we're at and the wells we did have at one time. But there, once eight comes online, we'll have two functional wells. Two, okay, thank you. Councillor reports. Nothing for me, thank you. Um, Yes, uh, yesterday the Rocky Senior Housing Council approved the 2019 audited financials and we've passed that information along to uh, corporate services. Uh, additionally, uh, the library in Rocky is closed to public, but we have our online services. Short and sweet. Nothing from me. The only thing I would wish to report is a little update on the Caroline Hub. They've been working on uh, plans to renovate the washrooms as the washrooms in the facility needed a bit of work. So they were getting quotes and I believe everything is now on hold as it's a little hard to get contractors out. The doctor's office is now closed at the hub. The chiropractic is closed and many of the medical facilities in the hub have just about slowed down due to the COVID-19 uh, virus so we will see when they get up and running okay is there a motion to accept all the reports please I would so move. all in favor motion carries unanimously so we now have our two closed session items uh, could I have a motion to go into closed session Councillor Duncan, all in favor? Motion carries.
It is 5.38 p.m. and we have just left our closed session. Uh, we have one motion. Uh, yes, uh, the motion is that Council sends a letter to the Town of Rocky Mountain House requesting that the Town sign a revised ICF agreement by March 27th to meet the legislated deadline of April 1st. Further discussion on that motion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. A motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Councilor Vandermeer, all in favor? Motion carries. Thank you all.